this? I don't know. These are all metal. These are really nice. And then patches. We love patches. Uh, both Tyler Wicken, shout out to Tyler Wicken. Both Tyler Wicken and I have a huge board in our office where we, we collect all the different patches that, post, that folks give us. Uh, we've got Bar Citizen patches from all over the world, including uh, one of my most cherished, a patch from Bar Citizen Iraq where it was just four enlisted servicemen having their own bar citizen quite a few years ago. Um, and then there's some curiosities, like, um, like this guy. I don't know, I, I asked him what I was supposed to do with this when he handed it to me, and he said, put it in your mouth. I understand that's what a poo lolly is for, but we'll do that after stream. Maybe. Uh, and then, of course, a uh, shout out to the Med Runners. Uh, I'll tell you, Med Runners, uh, one, of the, one of our favorite orgs in the game, dedicated just to helping other people. Uh, I ran into the Med Runners at breakfast this morning. And because I had a long, long, painful walk into the studio, uh, they literally put me in their car and drove me to the event today. So, shout out to the Med Runners, helping people in the game, helping people out of the game, doing the kind of things that we love. So, oh, and this, this was very cool. Uh, I don't know what this says. I think this is the manufacturer. I think this is the manufacturer name. This is Gatak, or, uh, or uh, I can't think of the name of the other one right now. Uh, and then this weird uh, Copion thing. So how are we doing on time? Oh, the time's not up there. All right, so one more thing we do before we throw it to Dan and Sam. Uh, I wanted to do, back in uh, CitizenCon, our first digital CitizenCon in 2021, uh, I made the mistake of reading online comments after the, after the presentation during the show. And there's nothing I like more than repeating the same mistakes of the past. So uh, our lovely social media team, uh, shout out to Galactica and uh, Mickey, uh, put up a thread asking for your comments about day one of CitizenCon. And let's go through and see some of what people said. Uh, Citizen of the Verse uh, said, Castra, my new home. A lovely picture of Castra there. Uh, we've got a serious fun says he loved the PU, that the PU got clarity on its next two systems and that the visual fidelity of Squadron 42 is off the charts. Oh, and that Zeus bomber jacket. I'm not wearing mine today. Who's got that Zeus bomber jacket on? Somebody come over here. This thing, this thing is amazing. Um, I, want to I can out, hear something uh, through you, I think. members of our uh, marketing and, mer and merchandise so. team, Mandy and Kat who led the charge to get the coolest jacket we've ever made based on an authentic M1A jacket. Uh, again, Mandy and Kat. If you see them over at the merch booth, tell them Jared sent you and tell them how much you appreciate their work on this. They, they're responsible for all the merch at this year's CitizenCon. And I've been to 10 of these things and I feel like this is the best merch we've had. I'm wearing Who's the ready to buy some blackout more? hoodie. Uh, today and this is a really great material. Yeah, this it's on, it's on the merch store if you guys want. Here. I don't know if it's still in uh, stock. Okay, that's enough shilling for the merchandise. Uh, There's also Rick the Ray. mouse. What is uh, his favorite thing Sorry? was the worm. And Sherman oh, okay, okay. And go ahead. Uh, yeah. Guy yeah, there's also like the mouse pad Cavill. for the bango. Uh, there uh, the if it's still in stock. Squadron 42 demo. Um, let's see. Uh, I mean, it's not a mouse pad. It's like a desk. Desk mat. It's all on pre-order right now. Yeah, but it could you know, still get out of stock even videos on Star Citizen, ah, sorry. Yeah. Making videos where the environment is actively trying to crack you is very, very hard. Like, none of that was faked. We, we got our poor guys, they got into that Zeus and took off, and you saw how it struggled to lift. You buy your bomber fake. jacket. That was act, the actual dynamic weather system pushing uh, down I'm thinking the about ship it, but and uh, saying, <laughs> no, you can take off. Uh, and then they managed to get it off. And then you wear it when you play the game. Straight line, so <laughs> this, right? Yeah. Is that for me? Everything you wear should be oh, started. They want me to wrap up. <laughs> How rude. Oh yeah, I need some stasters and socks. All right, so we'll make read one more comment. And some, some, and we'll, yeah, we'll some underwear. Uh, we're not going to read that one. <laughs> we're not going to read that one. I need boxer shorts with you a pico uh, at the mom. front. <laughs> or uh, okay. how they call it, uh, Stormwall. Uh, says my favorite part was when the sandworm said it's sandworm in time. And then sandwormed all over those guys. <laughs> we remember it exactly the same, uh, Uplinks. All right, so that does it for me. I'm going to throw it to Dan and uh, Sam, who I believe are over at the Sim Pits, and see what kind of hijinks they're getting into. <laughs> guys? Hi, everyone. Welcome back to CitizenCon Day 2. Woo! 
I'm Sam, and if you didn't meet me yesterday, I kind of do some voices and stuff. I also flew a carrick. Um, but I am supposed to be here with Dan, and for some reason he's not popping up like he did yesterday. That woman again, Jesus Christ. I think I, I can smell incompetence. Oh. I mean, she's oh, got Dan, a nice voice. There you are. Look, look not, not only is she ugly, but she's bad at this. Um, like, at least if she was good okay? at this, I can understand. Oh, no, I'm not doing all right. Look at this. I'm keep blacking out. Dan, I don't think you should try playing this game. I, I don't think I should either, but it's so fun. If you guys are here on the show, bad floor, these this. Monster Tech Sim Pits are really haptic. My ass is vibrating right now with the, the ricochet of bullets hitting my rear. Dan... Uh, shall I take over for you? Please, please take over. Okay, maybe I'll give him a break. Come on, Dan. All right. Help, thank you. <sighs> Turns out, not very good at video games. And Sam's really good at video How games. How much does it cost, man? So this is going to go well. Oh, the whole simpit? Yeah, let's see you get in the... Yeah. All right, well, maybe I mean, it's not so easy. Maybe it's not so easy. He not doesn't so come with the TV, right? To be fair, I uh, left no. you in a pretty shit situation. You were set up for failure. Come follow me. We're going to move away from my I mean, it's not, it's not crazy expensive. as a video game. But of course, everything is moments. relative, you know. Hi, guys. Welcome back to CitizenCon Day 2 here at they Manchester They need to make Central. community so management team T2. Like hopefully you guys enjoyed the panel for today. <laughs> we covered a bunch of stuff. Uh, I, no, I, I think that's T0. a bunch more for you guys to today. Between ships, between base building, just random people. Of road beyond, random people of the street. As you can see, we are here in the general lounge here at the uh, show floor, Hall B. Here at CisenCon, let's take a look. As you can see, we have our lovely Hornet. We have our players just chilling out, maxing, relaxing, all cool, shooting some saddle ball outside of school. When a couple of duel who were up to no good started making trouble in the neighborhood, we, blown behind. we got in one little fight, and Captain Bishop got scared, or Admiral Bishop got scared. We said Squadron 42, release date 2026. Who is hype about that? <laughs> awesome, guys. We are going to be covering a bunch of stuff here today. We have a bunch of community booths still to cover. We have some awesome models That's to show off here yeah. on the show floor <laughs> as well. <laughs> There's still so much more to cover, and I'm only really two excited. years away. We only have a Forever. Bit more time together, I want to make sure you guys are taken care of, and hopefully, you guys are having just as much fun watching the show as I am running it. Now, as you can see, we have our themed stuff. We didn't really get into the theming last year. I want to get down into the, sort of the, the micro this time. So let's take a look at the outside of these booths. As you can see, we have Biotacorp Waste. We have the Robert Space Industries. Come follow me a little bit. We're going to go a little bit into the, the community booth area. Just a little you bit. You are running it. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> as you can see, we have this problem in the verse as well. Get a look at that. People just stacking up He thinks he's running the show, boxes. really? <laughs> wasteful. Wasteful. For shame. He's, he's the replacement, the substitute clown. Littering. Hi, guys. Come follow me. We're He's not even the main out. clown. Hi, everybody. <laughs> We're making our way through. Guys, it has been such a pleasure to be back at CitizenCon. In case you don't know who I am, my name is Dan Howard. Dude, there has the to be something better to do with our time. Games. I produce our community managers. <laughs> wow, she's that's cute. Acapella, Interview her. Freya, Why are you Christine, cute? Why are you that's here? Wolf, that's Niku. <laughs> <laughs> All of you guys interact with us on Spectrum, on Twitter, X, uh, who cares what it's called these days. I help produce those guys. We don't sure care. Shut up. up. Information. <laughs> it's been such a pleasure getting to actually get to know you guys as well. You guys have been so amazing here at CisenCon this year. We're just making sure that we catch as many people here on the show floor as possible. In case you guys didn't check this out yesterday as well, we have the Addison Lounge. The Addison Lounge is a place just like the General Lounge for you guys to chill out, make sure you guys are getting a drink. If you guys have a VIP ticket, you guys have special access to bar and refreshments here as well. You guys don't have to wait in the long line. Make sure you guys are checking that out as well. Yui, thank you for your service. 
We have that huge United Empire of Earth timeline as well, going all the way back to 2137 to the pretty near recent future of 2950. It's only four years ago based on our in-lore world. And I think that's pretty much it. I mean, obviously we have the Hornet, we've covered that to death, so I'm not gonna cover it, but it still looks pretty cool. Now, I think we're ready to throw over to our first presentation, so I'm gonna throw it back over to Jared. We'll see you guys later for some more Community Booth stuff. I'll see you guys later. Thanks for watching. Now I'm just hydrating on camera. Just, <laughs> he's just doing his job. We are backstage now. This is an area that we don't usually get to see at Citizen Gun. Uh, this is the backstage area where the nerve center of the entire live sh stage show here. Uh, these are the folks who are working tirelessly to make sure that all see, the you see how right much more relaxed this guy is than the, the right other guy. Play all the right sounds play. Yeah. Hey everybody, how you doing? As you can see. As you can see, they're very, very focused. You excited to be here? The, the backstage area, that's where they make the Twitch Constant stream uh, crash. To doing their job. That, that's hey, where the I girls doing? line up so that Chris Roberts can uh, boink them. <laughs> <laughs> My mom likes what I do. All right, so guys, uh, that's it for the pre-show. We're, we're about, what, what time is it? How much time we got? We're about, oh, oh that's not even my clock. Uh, we're about 10 minutes away from the proper start I of bet day two. If you were a homosexual, uh, so a I bet you can get laid your if you're Chris to, Roberts uh, with a, snack, a bunch of nerds. Drink, uh, go to the bathroom, <laughs> kiss your loved ones goodbye <laughs> for the next four to five hours as we present day two. Imagine. No, actually, I don't uh, want to it's imagine. A different beast. It's got to be 5% at the least that we of the guys in there. Today is dedicated entirely to the, I, the I try not to think about these things. So, thanks for watching. We'll see you in about 10 minutes, everybody. I'm straight as an anvil arrow. <laughs> 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 Yes, it's it's the sophisticated thing to do to you know understand homosexuals and to be comfortable around them. <laughs> you know, it's, it's the twenty first century, man. Are you homophobic? <laughs> no, I'm not scared of them. <laughs> I, just, I just hate them. <laughs> Don't ban this. Don't ban this. No, we we, we love the gays. Yeah, yes, we love them. We're just making fun of them precisely because we love them. We're all gay. <laughs> Deep down. <laughs> Cl close it, close it. <clears throat> wow, so diverse the uh, community. Yeah, they're, they're all blue. Da ba dee da ba da. And a lot, many of them are fat, so. <laughs> And they're on the older side. Yeah, fat and bold. That's my people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm bold. I'm not. I'm not fat, but I'm getting there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect for a Star Citizen. It's the future. You're gonna have to shave your head anyway. For, you know, germs. <laughs> Come to think of it, Exile, there were a lot of people who were bald at the bar suit as we went to, right? Now that I think about it, that seems like well, an exciting so. thing. You know, when when men get old, they... Uh, is that true for also for black people? When they get old, they get bald usually, often? Uh, yeah. No, it is? I don't know. It's it's. I think so. I don't know. The yeah. American sample is so weird because they're mixed. I don't know. I don't know. You know that Latinos are not supposed to have, not Latinos, Native Americans are not supposed to have hair in their face. Hmm. If you see, if you see an, a Latino with hair in the face, it means he has quite, uh, he has white mixture or whatever. That's what the uh, big man told me. Huh. The music is phenomenal, phenomenal in this. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's the that's the Arena Commander, uh, one of the AC racing music. 
All right. I think it's called Speed Activated by uh, Pedro. Uh, what's his name again? Pedro um, Camacho. Camacho. Yeah. yeah. He's Portuguese. Yeah. He's Portuguese. Yeah. So, I, I love his know, stuff. Yeah. So they did something good. <laughs> the Portuguese. <laughs> I was talking with uh, Kierok the other day and uh, I told him I've never been to Portugal but I think it's a poor man's Spain and uh, Kierok says Spain is a poor man's Spain <laughs> 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 it's the funniest thing I've ever heard about Spain it's true <laughs> You know where I could go to the Frankfurt if they do it in Frankfurt next year I could go to Frankfurt because you know I can't go to England because I need the passport um, to renew my passport but in Frankfurt I can go without uh, you know with my old with my uh, um, expired passport you mean to a bar citizen or in general no uh, just uh, sorry, a citizen go next year ah okay because they have a studio in Frankfurt, so it's possible that next year it will be in Frankfurt. So uh, next year, either Frankfurt or uh, in Montreal or um, Austin, Texas. But I think, uh, not Austin because, you know, it was in the US last year. So either Frankfurt or Montreal. If I was them, I would open a studio in Japan. I would hire Japanese people to make, because you know, there's one system that's supposed to be Japanese. And I would hire them to make, uh, you know, put anime and shit. Chris Roberts would make anime real. Yes. <laughs> well, <laughs> they, you know, they could have Citizen gone there with, uh, you know, a mecha and, uh, and, you know, I don't know, those, those Gundam, why are the Gundam mecha so ugly? You know, the, the Zone of the Enders are amazing and the um, Armor Core are amazing, but the Gundam, why are they so childishly ugly? Do we know if, uh, like, they're Asian developed or, like, at all? We don't know. But, like, for the uh, Asians in the studio working on it? I don't know. You're asking about Gundam? Uh, no, I mean the ones that are in Star Citizen, the mech. The mechs. Oh, no, no, no. The, the other Star Citizen is, you know, it's the normal it's, uh, developers, white people, whatever. But, uh, you know, all we have is some concept art. They, they don't have, uh, they haven't actually made anything yet. Uh, Oh, but you know they are making those uh, that uh, uh, what's it called? Gadak, Gadak. This brand. They already have one of those ships in, and that looks a bit mecha inspired, but only a bit. It's not full on mecha. If you're gonna make an entire galaxy, you're gonna make a hundred star systems. You need that. Diversity, you know, <laughs> uh, it's in the future. You need, you need diversity. You gonna, so I believe that bringing in, uh, you know, the Japanese, they have the, they have their own aesthetic sense. They have their own. Um, just, ma I would make a Japanese studio, and I would, you know, what I would do? I would make a fucking Japanese faction fighting the UE or um, allied with the UE or whatever. So because you know, I wouldn't make a studio just for one solar system. Uh, you want them to keep cranking out stuff. Uh, they could crank out fucking Akira motorcycles and, um, you know, they could also make the Asian uh, part of the, when we make Earth, they can make the Asian part of Earth and they can make it distinct. And, you know, they should definitely think about it. I don't have any Picos in game. How do you get in your hangar, in your web hangar? Picos, there. I think I think it's a, it's like one time a year or something. You have to win a competition or something. I don't know.
Wow, it looks so cool being in there and the light. It's so much more uh, professional than last year. So much more. Um, they're definitely taking stuff, taking it a notch. This is another thing that people don't understand uh, why this game is taking uh, so long. When they started in 2012, it was just Chris Roberts, his wife, and like his manager or something. That's it. And they were, they built a studio, five studios, 1,300 people they had to recruit. And it's not just 1,300 because there's churn. You know, there's probably 2,000 people or more that passed through. Each of these people had to be headhunted. Uh, they now have a department of seven people just for recruitment. You know, they had to spin up, you know, for years they only had 50 people or then 100 people, then 150. Just building the studios is enough work, let alone building the games. Uh, and, and all these other initiatives, like one other, they have two weekly shows. They have uh, their convention, they have the bar citizens, like they, there's no reason for them to have all that stuff. I mean... No, obviously it helps uh, promote the game and all that but uh, does fucking CD Projekt Red do, do red citizen red bars or whatever no they fly all these people they fly are the developers they fly around the world to, to, to have beer with the, to drink with the guys you know and that that that's part of the, I think I wonder if that's part of their job actually do they get paid probably I would think they it's part of the job You know what would be cool? It would be cool if that was permanent. Like if they had that space forever and every week when Jared does the show, it's with a live audience. You could go there and sit. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, master of the self It might happen one day, you know. It might happen. And Mama Huckabee's second favorite son, Jared Huckabee. He's introducing himself, no? Yes, yes. <laughs> like, like, he, he's getting more every year. He's getting more and more. <laughs> more uh, histrionic. <laughs> we liked it so much the first time, we're going to do it again. Yeah. Now, as the last guy during the pre show said, day one was focused on the universe that we're creating. Day two is all about the destiny that you forge. Now, a little history lesson here. Back in 2015, the Persistent Universe was first launched. I think it was November or December or whatnot. Everybody remember Port Olisar? Yeah. Everybody remember that one Big Benny's machine that somehow you could move it? Yeah. And just, the Big Benny's challenge of spending hours and hours of, of just doing this? Trying to get that thing upstairs, downstairs, back into the hab. Shout out to Bad News Baron if you're watching. Now, those were the days. Now, since that time, the Precision Universe has grown. It's expanded. Uh, 3.0 arrived, and it had a whole bunch of new planets and moons and stuff like this. We've got Microtech, we've got Hurston, we've got uh, Area 18, and what's the last one? We got Lorville. If you live with the developers, they still call them Stanton 1, Stanton 2, Stanton 3, so it's hard getting the two realities to, to reconcile in your head. But since this time, you've all been visitors. You've logged in, and you've done your thing, you've, you've gone on adventures, you've fought some Xeno threat, you've mined some uh, barrel, apparently a whole lot of barrel, if we're looking at that tri uh, trivia from yesterday. Uh, but this entire time, you've been visitors. Starting next year, you stake a claim in the Next year, drink. <laughs> Starting next year. But it will be wiped every three months. 
and only if you buy yours. in the uh... <laughs> <laughs> and we have got a handful of gentlemen to tell you how <laughs> they're going to do it how you're going to do it and how amazing it's all going to be so please welcome to this stage design director for star citizen and squadron 42 one of my dear friends one of my dms hey when are we playing again that's not a good look all right please welcome to the stage uh, design director rick porter I thought that uh, he was the DM. That would be the switcher on. Thank you, Jared. And thank you, Citizen yeah, Khan. It is an honor to be here. Yesterday, we presented the verse that we're creating for you. We shared new tech, locations, he does look like a DM. <laughs> creatures, giant worm, social features, things we're doing with orgs. We even played the first chapter of Squadron 42 live. How great was that? Yeah? Ah, uh, few minor glitches, but nothing we can't sort out. So today, with another two years, just exciting to talk about. <laughs> mm -hmm. But instead of focusing on what we're creating for you, we want to show you the world that you can. Twenty twenty-seven. With crafting, we're going to give you the next tools year to create your own loot, to build your own home. Crafting will fundamentally change not only how you play the game, but why you play the wow. game. So, what is crafting? Why does it matter? Why should you be as excited as I am about this? Well, first off, crafting is a profession. It requires going to come out of tools, tubes like in Rust. The knowledge of how to use them. <laughs> crafting offers <laughs> You become a better crafter by learning new blueprints and upgrading them. We just copied Rust. <laughs> the space should go through the go tubes. Out and you crafting, <laughs> we're adding depth and meaning to those With activities. Nano. Crafting provides customization. There isn't just one really way to just craft a something. Series of like tubes. I said, we have upgrades. How you make and upgrade the things you craft is sometimes just as important as what you're crafting. In addition, you can earn cosmetic upgrades, craft unique items, even subscriber flair. But nowhere is this versatility more obvious than base building. We're going to have nearly limitless options for how you construct your home, how to customize your base to meet your own goals. Most importantly, crafting gives you new, a lot of new choices. The choices will impact your goals in the game, your interactions with other players, and eventually how you see the game itself. So where do we get started with crafting? <laughs> well, you can't craft without materials. Luckily, we've got a lot of ways to gather resources in the game. And crafting is designed to complement and expand on all of these existing gathering professions, as well as future additions. Let's take a closer look at mining as an example. We've got hand mining and vehicle mining and ship mining. That's a lot of mining. But with crafting, we're going to introduce a lot of materials. So there's not just more to mine, but we're also going to specialize. So for instance, each type of mining will have its own unique materials to gather. Gathering specific materials efficiently. If they introduce digging, I would be like, right fuck. <laughs> Let's talk about refining. I'd be like, life is futile. Currently, only mining resources can oh, be man. refined, but doing so allows you to turn them into more valuable processed resources. With crafting, we're going to expand refining to include options for all raw materials. In addition to expanding the variety of materials you can gather, refining lets you create process materials that you're going to need to craft your upgraded blueprints. So now that you've gathered you all these materials, what do you do with them? Currently, your only <laughs> options in the game really are to like, sell them to a shop or maybe complete a contract. You make jam. <laughs> Adding crafting to the game radically changes your options. You can still you never mine, made jam? refine, and sell your resources. Oh, my grandfather used now you have the option to make valuable and unique jam. items. Lots of sugar. Weapons, armor, even vehicles and ships. <laughs> right? And by valuable, I mean that the crafted gear that you create has the potential to be better than anything you can buy in a shop. Yeah, I don't know if I like that. 
But crafting just doesn't end with shiny new gear. Think much bigger. Crafting enables you to build your own home among the stars. Space stations. You choose to make a farm, a hunting lodge, an industrial complex, your own trading hub, a military outpost, even a sprawling town with your friends and org mates. Fuck, that is cool. Why am I not seeing videos? Where are the videos, dude? <laughs> but it's all optional. I don't even see slides. You choose to focus it's on just gathering talking. resources and sell them to crafters that need them. You can skip gathering and refining and just focus on being the best crafter you can be. Or you can leave all that gathering and crafting nonsense to other people and just focus on trade and make some money. But that brings me to my last point. Player choice matters. When a player makes a choice, they assign value. Trying to sell you on the scam Players right choices now. Choices about crafting and base building to drive player trade. The community's choices will determine the value of the materials and the crafted goods you can all make. Dude, I can't look at the bottom left. It says citizen con. An economy alongside players, but now you'll have more options about where you invest. It's right there. It's right there in our faces. Twenty-nine fifty-four. Yeah, I'm giving you a nice overview. It's the new con here. for citizens. And we have a lot more planned for the, the future. Con. Now, Get it. Dude, this, is, the this is very boring. We're, we're not even just live. Introduce some of my fellow developers <laughs> to come up on stage. They've got exciting details to share with you about the specifics of our new crafting details. systems. Details? What do you mean? What are the videos, dude? Gameplay improvements <laughs> and most exciting. You've got to hear from the programmers. Anyway, an update to <laughs> <laughs> Tool chain updates. <laughs> okay, no, Starting off, let's welcome Jacob Taylor to the stage. <laughs> I moved my mouse. Are we seeing the same thing? Like, is it just the refining slide? Thank you, Rick. No, and hello, it's like Citizen people moving around. And... Yeah, they, they, they were just showing us, showing us slides. Hi, I'm Jacob, senior gameplay programmer on Crime. The card. Rick has showed us how crafting us will link con. into a lot of existing and new gameplay, but I think it's time we get into some of the details. I'm going to tell you about the new game mechanics we're introducing, starting with blueprints. Before you can craft anything, you'll need a blueprint. Blueprints provide the recipe to perform all kinds of crafting processes, including refining. You can acquire blueprints through various activities. Some you can buy, some you can find, and some can be unlocked or earned in other ways. You can also upgrade your blueprints through research. We'll go into more detail about what this means a bit later. So, blueprints are the recipe, and Rick already told us the materials you gather and refine will be the ingredients. But Can you guys hear me? To it than that. Yes. Yeah. We have a new okay. concept for materials: material quality. Quality is a property we're adding to all resources you can gather. That's an abstract measurement of how good it is at being whatever it is. You can think of this as the purity of a metal, or the ripeness of a fruit, or something along those lines. It's definitely a lifting. Will be Lifted that from raw everything at a quality through the refining process to influence what that batch of materials is best used for in crafting. High quality is more desirable overall, but is more rare, and there are still important uses for low quality materials. More on that later. All raw materials you find in the verse will have a quality rating that's generated based on some rules, the same kind of rules you heard about from the Planet Tech team yesterday. You'll find the same material in many places, but with varying qualities, so you might want to explore to find the best. Some materials that are already rare will be even more valuable if you can find them with high quality. But what's quality for? It's for item stats. Alongside quality, we're introducing a new item stat system to the game. This will allow relevant properties of craftable items 
to be affected by the quality of materials used to craft them. For resources, just a single quality rating is sufficient to provide variation. But craftable items have such diverse purposes that we need a more detailed system to provide both progression and customization options. We aim to have meaningful item stats for all craftable items. But some examples would be the damage and fire rate of a gun, the wear resistance of a ship component, or even the satiation provided by eating a hot dog. So, as I said, the quality of materials will directly affect the item stats, such that higher quality results in better stats. Most items require multiple different materials to make, which may each influence different stats. And in many cases, you'll have a choice of materials to use, which lets you decide which stats to focus on to tailor your items to your playstyle. Here we see I'm making a gun with high quality aluminium, giving me a nice bonus to integrity and weight. But someone sold me low quality copper, so I don't get as much fire rate bonus as I could have. To go even further, researching your fabrication blueprints allows you to build higher tiers of an item with improved base stats. So a higher tier item will be better than a lower tier item that was made with materials of the same quality. Where does the pledge Making store come in all of this? That's what I want to know. More advanced materials, but it's also how you access greater choice. Well, you're, you're buying the blueprints, no? Improve. Yeah, this I guess. This means that your high tier items can not only be better overall, but also more specialized in the areas that are important to you. Most yeah, I have a blueprint have for everything in the pledge store. They have a blueprint for, for a javelin. Made with appropriately impressive materials. For every single component <laughs> of the javelin, they have a blueprint. <laughs> like, <it's> like, <laughs> <laughs> and vehicles are so important that they will go up to tier five. Okay. A way to really invest in making your favorite vehicles excel. Up to tier five. What of does course, that mean? Many of you have already bought your favorite. Is there a retribution? Uh... So you don't really need to make them from scratch, right? <laughs> or maybe you've pirated, salvaged, or otherwise How commandeered How many in the pledge stores do I need to? Not to worry. Have. You can still benefit from crafting by using an upgrade blueprint to increase the tier of an existing vehicle, including. including the usual stat improvements and customization. Upgrading a vehicle can save a lot of time over crafting it from scratch, so it's a convenient way for established vehicle owners to bring the benefits of item stats to their fleet. Let's take a look in-game at the difference it makes to have high-tier equipment made from high-quality materials. See how the recoil is reduced on our high-tier gun. The spooling is faster stats? on a high-tier quantum drive. Jesus. And a high-tier scraper beam is much more effective. Jesus. So. That's an overview of crafting's key game mechanics. I'll now hand over to Torsten to walk you through the full crafting process. Thank you. So does, my, L so does my LTI cover the cover, <laughs> <laughs> cover anything? It cover the damage. Sweet trust, oh, summer no. child. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. Hi, I'm Torsten, lead system designer of the CGP system design team. Oh, there we go. Somebody said it. Does I can't read this shit about crates. If it doesn't, it's a scam. It's a scam. <laughs> you will start with acquiring the correct blueprints as the first step in the crafting process. 
as Jacob already mentioned, blueprints can be acquired in multiple ways. <laughs> Let me give you some blueprint process. Uh, go to store. Commonly available blueprints. <laughs> <laughs> Log in the robber space and click. Click in loot crates. Uh, add All to cart. In our game. <laughs> Swipe credit card. Some blueprints can be challenging to find. So players you can save the credit card for future preferences if you want in the store. <laughs> <laughs> While you may find a blueprint on a data pad or other portable device, the blueprint itself is not a physical item. You don't collect them in a box or stack them on a bookshelf. Blueprints are digital. Once you claim one, it is permanently added to your personal library. This library... It's in your web hanger. This library <laughs> is persistent to your character, and every blueprint you claim is yours forever. Uh, unless you melt it. This library, or trade it this library is on the blockchain. But it does not just <laughs> end the blockchain. Those tiers of quality NFT. that Jacob mentioned are unlocked through blueprint it's on research. the internet computer. Research requires a research data bank which can upgrade your blueprints. Upgrading here means that you unlock a blueprint that allows you to create a better, higher tier version of the same item using more advanced materials. Note, you will still have access to the lower tier versions if you want to craft the cheaper version. In order to upgrade a blueprint, you may need to perform certain actions. In this example, we need to craft 100 volt pistols and have it doesn't sound grindy at all. Rate. <laughs> Other examples would be collect resources, complete missions, or acquire research data from the science guild. He's talking about when, when Lyft did this, this it wasn't grindy at all. <laughs> to the action Where did they get this from? This is from it Starbase. Time oh, for craft the 100 data data bank to process your research data and unlock the upgrade. You are also limited in how many research projects you can pursue at once. Now that you have your blueprint and you decided what to craft, you also know what resources to look for. Every blueprint you find will have unique requirements in their resource needs. It will not just be you need iron. We want to make use of the professions we have to meaningfully involve them in the crafting process. Especially for the more advanced blueprints, you can expect that it will require materials for multiple sources. And as already mentioned by Jacob, pay attention to the quality. If you want to have the perfect item, you also need the best quality. Here, the best way to find the best resources is to get out and explore the worst. If you want to find the best hidden materials, then you get yourself a top quality radar. Once you've collected the raw materials, the next step is refining them. Refining, like crafting, requires blueprints. Refining blueprints take primary, secondary, and catalyst materials and produce refined materials. The rule is very simple. The quality of the primary raw material defines the quality of the refined material. The secondary material you put in has an impact on the quantity and the time the refining process will take. An optional catalyst can speed up the process further. Let me give you a simple example. If you want high quality steel, you need to put in the best iron you have in the primary slot. You, can put an, you can put any quality coal in the secondary slot without affecting the quality of the steel. But the quality of the coal will influence how much of it you need to produce steel. As an example, if you put in low quality coal, you might require four SCU of coal versus high quality coal that only requires two SCU. This is one of the important use cases for low quality materials that Jacob mentioned. You can use refining stations in the world as they will be converted to this new process. You can build your own refineries for yourself, you can get your org to help you out, or you can simply trade for the materials that you need on the open market. Now we are reaching the final step. You've got the blueprints, you gathered resources and refined materials. 
Now you can create the item you want. And this item can be anything. You will be able to craft anything from FPS equipment to vehicle components, even entire vehicles and buildings. You just need access to the relevant crafting machine. Talking about crafting machines. We will have a variety for you that differ in what process they can support, like a refinery or a dedicated vehicle crafting machine. We will also find them in various places. There will be communal ones like the station refineries you already know, player-owned that can be in your personal hangar, a vehicle or your base. As all that we have talked about just now, these crafting machines also come in tiers. Here, the tiers will affect how well those machines do their job. You will not only progress in the products you produce, but also in the infrastructure to produce your work. Was there a refining ship? Just to give or you an idea, has a refining you module on it? Here are some examples. Of yeah, the there is. What, the Galaxy? There's a couple. There's, there's the nutrition fabricator. Are they going to be the highest the quality if you pay for them? An item fabricator and <laughs> even fabricators of a much larger scale we will talk about later. Talking about scale, I would like to talk about the future of crafting and the scale it will have in the game that you all know and how it will change the game moving forward. As you all know, we, had a, we have a lot of items in the game and they all require their own unique blueprints. That means our aim is to have more than 1,000 blueprints that include the creation and the refining blueprints. And each of those can be researched to unlock tier upgrades up to tier 3 or tier 5. That's a lot of blueprints. And it will surely take a lot of time to unlock everything. So I, personally, recommend that you, as the crafter you are, focus on a specific field first and extend your knowledge from there. Collaborate and coordinate with your friends and fellow players. If you're part of a group, we invite you to share responsibilities with your org mates. Maybe you will be the FPS crafter while your friend is a ship crafter, but they know a ship component crafter specialist. There's a lot of content, and it will continue to grow. You can craft time. chairs. <laughs> you are free to be a generalist crafter, Chair a specialist, specialist, or something in between. Pick the blueprints you care about and be the best. Have an exotic shield generator that no one else has the blueprint for but you. Help others and earn credits while doing so. It is a real profession in the game that will benefit from your dedication and attention. As you can tell, crafting will have a huge impact on everything in the game. Even if you do not want to get actively involved, at some point you will stumble over a weapon that got crafted by someone else and you will be using it. People will start selling their crafting goods or the refined materials or even the raw materials for the sole purpose of fulfilling the demand created by crafting. Players like you can become well-known specialists that are sought out to get certain things crafted from. With the ever-expanding game we all love, we will continuously expand our crafting to offer you long-term progression that involves the entirety of our game. And you might have guessed it already, but there's one more thing that crafting is the foundation of, and that is base building. I will now hand over to Luke. Enjoy the second part of this presentation. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, citizens. <laughs> Who is excited to start talking about this next topic?
Let's get into it. My name is Luc Gijsbertse. I'm the lead environment artist on base building structures. Now that we have an understanding of the fundamentals of crafting, thanks to Jacob and Thorsten, we can explore how crafting is the foundation of base building. Up until now, everything in the game we made for you. From here on, we will give you the tools to build your own stories, your own homes, and truly make the universe yours. Join me on a journey on building our own habitable home on Pyro. Keep in mind that the following footage is work in progress, including its UI, design, and visuals. And we're super excited to share this with you. We found a beautiful location by a lake. This is where we build ourselves a home. To do so, we need some resources and the construction graph card. The construction graph card allows us to survey the land, claim the land in a lawful system, 35, and it allows us to build structures. As we've already found the location and don't need to claim land in lawless pyro, we can straight dive into building our base. Keep in mind, the following UI that's is a work cool. in progress. Wow, that, that's damn cool. Oh, RDS, yeah. man. Look, look, RDS. A survey drone that deploys from the top of the cart gives wow. us a controllable, augmented view of the land. In the new structure mode, we'll pick wow. a small base structure in the background. and construct. For this demo, the construction yeah, you can will see be instantaneous. Around. But in the final wow. product, this will Amazing. take you quite some time. We've done it. We've built our first structure. Let's have a look on the inside. As we walk into the small basic structure, we see an empty interior that is dimly lit. It's up to us to define what we will use this space for. In our case, we will want to make it into a home. We can see that the lights are still off, and that is a problem. Because no lights means no atmosphere, no breathable atmosphere. So it's not ideal to live in. So how do we solve this issue? We can improve this by providing the building with power. Let's see if we can build something that helps us out. But Dude. before we dive into more building, Let's take a quick moment to enjoy the freedom that the survey drone provides us with and admire the aesthetics of our first structure. Wow, amazing, amazing. Imagine and the screenshots that people were uh... doing there. <laughs> Keep in mind that base building is still work in progress, but what you're seeing right now has been recorded directly in the client and works seamlessly between first person and the building mode. Okay, enough. Back to base building. In the list of new structures, we see a small fuel generator. That is something that could solve our problem, I think. Power providing structures need to be hooked up to other buildings inside construction ER mode. But we'll explain this later. The fuel generator is one of several structures that provides power, each with that their own insane, benefits dude. and drawbacks. Fuel power is quick and easy to build but it requires a constant supply of fuel besides... It feels like I'm looking at a different game now. <laughs> if the structure is not maintained, it will halt its activity. Players will need to maintain fuses to keep the, beta, uh, the building operational. The it's fucking fuse. fuse. What is the fuse anyway? The I don't even know what it, it is. This is where the fuse it's goes. It's a thing about jig that you need Next to put up, in the thing. It's an electric thing. that gives us the thing. Thing. status of our building. <laughs> And, more importantly... The real vehicle fam fuses. Uh, wow. So. Dude. Uh, this is like an RDS at a fidelity that is unreal. That should do it. Let's yeah. see if we got power in the building now. Can you imagine Age As of Empires notice, at this fidelity? The you know, full castle. You put the castle the in. content has been consumed during the construction process. That, that's of Age of Empires 15. <laughs> No, it will never happen. We and already have like Age of Empires 4 or 5 or something, and it's the same the as the first. No, but that, that's what building. I'm saying. Star Citizen is Age of Empires 15. 
yeah, I yeah. wonder what he was up to earlier though. I hope we have to think about our carbon footprint with the fuel generator. Because that's not very wow. good for climate change. Declan has been busy decorating the place. <laughs> We're in pyro. As you can see, the lights are now properly working. We got atmosphere. And uh, we can start to use the item Aid fabricator incoming. now that there is power. <laughs> Always handy in case we need a fuse. Well, that, that's what people are going to say. <laughs> but <laughs> when bombs cost 500k so a pop, <laughs> they're not going to do that. The place. If, if, you have a shield, if you have a shield... If you have, you have a shield that can withstand a with bunch power. of bombs, then yeah. the other guy has to spend millions to take you down. We have so, a place that we yeah. can live in. Hey, you could, you could, you it could pay for money. Much, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Just you enough. pay real money. <laughs> Musk, Musk is gonna come Thank in, you. throw a billion, and just kill everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Make yeah. everybody cry. Yeah, I just send a couple of dollars to some Chinese slaves. <laughs> now that we have a rough understanding of how base building works, let's dive into some of the specifics of what we just saw. The construction graph card is one building. of four devices used for base building. The graph card is a mobile device that lets you construct a variety of small structures and has been designed specifically to fit into the smallest ships like the Drake Cutter. The graph card allows us to survey the land, to find a good location, to claim the land with credits when we're all in a lawful system like Stanton, and most importantly, it lets us build structures. To use the graph card, we will first need to deploy it. Want a digging mech? Once deployed, we see two small wow. structures <laughs> inside the card, <laughs> and the interactive screen gets revealed to us. From here, we can deploy the survey drone from the extended top part of the card. The this whole idea of the survey drone is, is uh, the surrounding amazing. Area using augmented reality mode, ER mode for short. Let's have a look at some UI concepts of how this augmented reality mode will look like. Here's a concept of construction ER. From here, we get a more detailed view of the land. Where can and can't I settle? For an example, inside a nature reserve, construction will be prohibited. A nearby are nearby areas flat enough to place my structures on? Are there any underground extraction deposits nearby? And if so, what are their quality and quantity? Let's say we found a good place to start building our base. Then next up, we need to find a good place for our first structure. Wow, On look the at left that hand UI. Side, we can see that we're now in structure creation mode. It's a command and conquer. <laughs> Underneath that, there is a list of structures that we can build. Once you have chosen a structure, you'll drag it onto the terrain shown, uh, that will be shown then as a physicalized hologram. From here, you can move and rotate to find the perfect position for your structure. Now that we have chosen a position for our structure, we will need to supply it with crafting materials. Just like the crafting interface that we saw earlier, this is where you choose the materials, and the better materials you choose will result in a better structure. It looks like Once it looks ready, like uh, we'll Imperium. The button on the right bottom to send the construction drones printing to the buildings. The automated construction drones will take off from the construction graph card and fly to nearby resources drones. to fill their internal storage and then fly over to the construction site to print the building until their internal storage has been depleted. The construction drone then repeats the loop by filling its internal storage again by nearby resources. Printing buildings will take some time. Keep the construction supplied so that you don't delay the process yes. any further. Let's say our building did just finish printing, then what? Then we need, power, uh, we need to power the building. All structures will Why have a unpowered power? and a powered state that we can manage inside the resource manager. To provide st uh, structures with power, we can easily link generators to structures that need power in the resource management menu within construction ER. We can also link multiple buildings together. Wow. And we can assess the power consumption and shortage of, uh, inside this resource management screen. 
Keep in mind that operational structures like power generators require maintenance <laughs> of their producers <laughs> and sometimes need to be supply uh, and sometimes need supplies coming in. You think that there's a chance they might not sell these buildings? Now that we have a structure money? and power, what can we do next? Uh, then we can actually maybe they will sell like purple versions structure. of the building structures can yeah, be upgraded be. from tier one till tier three the better material you provide the better the improvement will be just, be just like jacob and thorsten explained in the crafting presentation tier upgrades can for example improve the structural integrity of the building or make its resource consumption more efficient to really make your base feel like home you will want to decorate your base with a wide variety of furniture pieces that can be bought, crafted, and found in the universe. It's up to you to define what you want this space to be. Do you want to decorate it as a hospital? Do you want to make it into a workshop? Do you want to make it into a luxurious bedroom? It's up to you. Furniture can easily be placed and moved using decorative ER mode as a hologram. This is so your furniture can easily fit through doors. This feature is accessible through nearby construction devices, allowing you to place down furniture pieces or even crafting machines that otherwise wouldn't fit through the door. And you get to place them directly from your local inventory. The less trusted among you, or anyone settling in Pyro for that matter, may want to Mac lock their furniture into place so that only you and your friends get to re, uh, rearrange your decorations. And best of all, decorative ER is not exclusive to base building and can also be used for personal hangers and ships. Dude, I don't like the fact that you, uh, you magically bring big furniture in the hab, even though the door to is small, recap, I don't get how this what works. What are the essentials for any base? Yeah. One, come prepared, bring the right resources, and a construction device with you. Two, use the resource manager, power generators. Yeah, to I would make hope your, you would have to uh, get it from like a hanger or some, some and box, you know, base and then you place it manually. And by replacing out worn fuses. But you have to take three, it through the door. I don't get how you avoid. Personalize your base, personal hanger and ship with decorative ER. And there we if have, we have uh, our home, home in Pyro. Mm -hmm. Now that we have an understanding of the basics of base building, we'll explore can make how it like you can an build, IKEA, you know, uh, and make more you have to build than it just inside. a home. But yeah, or, or the, whole, the wall of the hab goes down. Oh, the designer yeah, yeah. behind base building. I'd like to say a quick thank you for those who made this presentation possible. Oh, so maybe we need tubes. To Eddie, uh, Brandon, Jack, yes. Dan, Mark, <laughs> Shao, <laughs> Stefan C, <laughs> for Paul, <furniture> Stefan T, <laughs> Paul, Joel, <laughs> and Rob for your efforts and dedication. That's why they didn't play rough, so they don't know about the cube. That's why they didn't put the cube. <laughs> now give me a warm welcome <laughs> for Declan. <laughs> nice one, James. All right. Thank you, Luke. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Deck. I am the system designer behind crafting and base building, and we've just seen a nice little base, right? That's good for camping the woods. Maybe you want to place it down to the next to big redwoods, mm -hmm. go and explore, or a place to stash some loot you perhaps shouldn't have. But do you want to see a big base? Yeah. Big base. Good, because we're going to industrialize. You want to see my, my big base, baby? So we're going to set ourselves a goal now. before we do a video, and we're going to create a base that's capable of crafting something that's bigger than the item fabricator can handle. It's been a bit of a spoiler already as to what it's going to be. So to kick us off, called in the help of a friend who has a specialized, not yet revealed base building vehicle, and he's built us this. It is the construction hub. This has four automated drones compared to the grav carts too. They can build small, medium, and large buildings. So far, we've only seen small. Automated drones are capable of building one structure each simultaneously, so four is quite a big advantage. Base elevator coming! A thousand bucks LTI! <laughs> 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 
we'll pop into our construction AR and we'll get down a generator. We'll connect some buildings together. Just they so need to just enable sending your whole check in. For yes, exactly. Automatic. This is the last feature, new feature. You can just sign over <laughs> your. Uh, <laughs> so we've settled on one of the. Brand and the CRG new gives you an allowance so you can eat every month. This particular one is a large solid extractor. We'll also have liquid and gas depending Jeez. on which type of deposit that you've settled on. Dude, it was going to destroy Satisfactory. We have our output grid here where we're getting all the brand new resources up out the ground. Is Satisfactory plant or annihilation? Satisfactory annihilation! <laughs> it's important to note that once these things are set up, it's not a case of just free resources forever. On key structures like this, there are fuses which are occasionally replaced, as well as environmental wear which can be fixed using crafting materials. Age of satisfactory annihilation, that's it. That's going to be so much fun griefing. The whole concept of pyro, building base and pyro is ridiculous. <laughs> Why would you want to do that? And then next to the fucking uh, worm, dude. <laughs> the worm comes and just destroys your shit. <laughs> and then the people are dropping bombs on the, on the worm while the worm is destroying you. <laughs> and you're trying to like put on your underwear. You're in your base. All right. Now we want to send those underwear. raw resources into the more valuable refined materials we saw the process talked about earlier with Thorson. Like, of course we want this, it is our refinery. If, Once again, but if you're clicking quickly, if you can you manage to get the pledge store before your stuff is destroyed. You buy credit and once continue. Produce. Refinery has input and output grids for input, as you might expect. It's for the resources which Dude, this is ridiculous. See how big this is? This is ridiculous. Sort of refined goods. <laughs> this is a terminal where you would select which blueprint you want to use, and therefore which type of refining method you want. Dude, I didn't expect this uh, early, this quickly, um, such scale. That's ridiculous. Like you're building a. Uh... A lot of wow, trades here with our extractor looks so and our refinery, too. so we're going to put down our elevator storage. Who's going to buy this stuff? Are you guys going to start buying this stuff? This <laughs> <laughs> is really starting to build, now, but it's worth me mentioning again here that... How much money is this going to be? These buildings down instantly in this video. Large <laughs> this free it will take some time with the automated construction <laughs> drones. But the smallest... We don't got to pay anything. We, video we, we could totally grind for all this. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's an orange, that's a new one. The orange uh, mule, I've never seen it before. Finally, the mule will be useful. Maybe. Yeah, we, we should do it zero to hero, you know. We start with an aurora. Right. Just sell all our Just accounts. Just keep on putting down <laughs> because we want as much as that valuable resource out of the ground as quick as possible. And with base building, we're introducing the concept oh, wow, of a wow, that was the MPU. network. What this Dude, will allow everything you to do is so is amazing now. All the all the cool stuff is amazing. Together and in turn they will share the same storage. So, so as we're you got a freight elevator that you built yourself. Freight elevator A. Yes, I am. And then when wow, we're streaming it on freight elevator flying, A, I forgot. there is a distance the limit, but you can daisy chain the elevator by the together Zeus. to extend that, and by it has all been contained within the same base. Bye now. <laughs> <laughs> By a freight elevator. Now, as we expand, we might want to invite more people to join us. This Dude, is look easy how to do. The it's insane. That we can set up granting people access to our base, and they wow, can even build their inside. own structures if they wish. We can also that give them access to existing structures, which is how you can form your org storage using those freight elevators. Jesus Christ! Look at the. We can play chess. I, w I want to play poker. Where's the chess poker is game? Chess endgame. Endgame. You want to get to the end? Safe place yes. to store our <laughs> so, the trusty hangar will do. But you can build your own hangars. What the hell? Wow. Dude, this is, this is ridiculous. Christ. I was not expecting it. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that. 
see it has this large, we call it a foundation tile. It's quite special and it, it can actually deform the terrain around it, making it easy to place such a huge structure like this. You can also place other buildings on it, so it's easy for making large, sprawling bases. However, there is one final piece of the puzzle the way, that we need to achieve our goal, and it is this, our very own fabrication hangar. Does anyone Jeez. want to guess what we're going to build in a fabrication hangar? A Polaris. <laughs> an Idris, maybe not, maybe not an Idris, if I'm honest. <laughs> we'll have a drive around, we'll go to the entrance and we'll see what's in store for us. Look, it would take a lot of A2 bombs to destroy all that. I don't know, maybe three. Where's the shield, man? Where's the shield? It'd be so cool to be playing FPS fights in this base. Well, where do you put the TC? <laughs> it like whatever it is, in the wall, in the wall, you hide it in the wall. How many honeycombs do I get to protect it with? <laughs> <laughs> He has no honeycombs, it's like the big ones that <laughs> don't know how to play. <laughs> of course, we're gonna build ourselves. We're gonna, can I roof snipe from it? <laughs> I wonder how much wood you need for upkeep. Dude, so, you, you should be able to build the ships too then. Industrializing. We've tapped into the brand new resources and we've made use of them by turning them into the more valuable refined materials. We've introduced freight elevator networks Dude. which are great for logistics and hauling. When the satisfactory when crowd, when the base building crowd sees this stuff, items, such as ships. the game is going to go like double or triple. Them, and play content with them. But because they are a crafted item, they can also be sold to other players. So we can... Setting up shop, yes! So... With base building, you're going to be able to set up your own shops, and there's two main ways you can do this. The first is using a dedicated trading terminal. You can link these to your freight elevators, and in turn, any items within can be listed for sale at a price you deem reasonable. And this includes resources, refined materials, and so on. Second is by the BMM. Using the terminal, visiting <laughs> players can browse what's BMM offer, Mark two. purchase, and then collect from that same freight elevator. <laughs> Mark two, yeah. The second method is to set up a physical shop in the world. By using the decorator AR we saw earlier with Luke, you can maglock items and then list them for sale. Once again, browsing players, they can see the price of the maglocked item, purchase it, which then removes the maglock. Yeah. That's cool. That's awesome. That is awesome. Again, I have not seen that in any other game. The physical shops is you can genuinely make it feel like a store. You can put items on shelving. You can even go as far as to make your own ship showroom. You can advertise your wares on a mobile glass room. for UEC. However, it is important to note that the point of purchase will always occur at the base itself. Now that we know how to set up shop, I just want to take a moment to talk about why it's so impactful for crafting and base building the game as a whole. Understandably, throughout this presentation, we've been telling you why you want to craft all these things or why you want to build this big base. But maybe you don't have the time to build a big base and maintain it. Maybe you want to spend your time doing the missions, you want to do your beacons, that's how you want to make your credits instead. Shops mean that you can benefit from the players who do want to spend the time making those bases or crafting those specialist items, and then you can purchase them from them which is very important because crafted items using high quality materials will be the most powerful in the game. On the flip side, if you do specialize, maybe you end up cornering the markets for a particular item or resource and your shop will then turn into a hotspot of activity, making you loads of credits. Some of you will become infamous because of it. But bear in mind, a successful shop also depends on location. Do you want your customers on edge in This guy is great in giving a talk. Quality materials, yeah. Or do you want to spend time hauling them all the way over to safer, safer systems where your customers can be more at peace? We've talked about selling items. Let's sell the look of your base. We have foundation tiles which can help you divide up wow. the foundation tiles. Foundation decals, sorry, which help you divide up the foundation tile. You can place them freely wherever you want, and they just help you mark up areas like, I want to use this place for cargo, I want this for housing, vehicles, and so on. You can, you can turn all of Pyro like a, a, a factorio into... Uh... Yeah, it's going to turn into Area 18. Area 18, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's what I was thinking. 
if all the players decide, let's all go to this one, moon. <laughs> as well as had your own custom sex, so if you're part of an orc, too. the blue base, the blue buildings that have your name are definitely yours. Wow! We have some forms of base building which are either still in the design phase or early white box, but we want to share some details. First up, we have farming and ranching. Farming, it comes in two general types. We have our low-tech farming and then high-tech. Low-tech consists of farming seeds. Planting them in the appropriate environment. Base Remember farms back to yesterday, the breaking new world, we have soil 15. types and such now. That will play a part. As well as supplying them with nutrients and then just harvesting them when they're grown. High tech, it's a bit more involved because you've got to make the high tech rape cows here. here. So you can make milk. Ranching. And then there's a new group that's, a new group that's Greenpeace. It's against uh, farming. We'll make a whole planet, New India. Not every animal is ranching inside soon, but the quasi grazer will, of course. We worship the space cow. Not yet. Maybe. No. Wow. Yeah, we're gonna have space vegans. We have a few more additional archetypes. We have landing pads, garages, roads, fencing, as well it's as new all variants of LTI. That we've seen today. For it's instance, well, the power so. generator, there'll be solar power, fusion, geothermal. Roads and fencing. As well as the XL structure class. So if you remember, everything we've seen today, the biggest we've Fences, seen today, that's is large. XL is larger than large. And then you have your defense. Wow. Everybody likes defense. So they they want to build areas, a wall. You have That's good. levels of security provided <laughs> for you with That's max racism. security. You are protected by planetary shield tech. They However, make the vandal wall, paper. Pyro and the likes. <laughs> you have to provide your own defenses. These come in the form of perimeter walls, shielding, which prevents aerial bombardments and then a range of automated turrets, such as PDC to shoot down missiles, anti-air, anti-vehicle, and anti Dude, So maybe you can just like put so many turrets down that nobody Durandal, will have enough firepower. Whilst you spend this entire time talking about how you can expand a single base, you can, of course, have multiple. These can be across a single planet, moons across multiple systems. There are advantages and disadvantages of locations and base types. For example, in lawful areas, you'll need to buy your land for UEC, Pay a tax to be able to so build, can you imagine game two nearby turn, bases wallets, no cost, on Pyro high chance of better quality materials, might be fighting like Command and Conquer? Backup. You know, they'll be building, the printing be tanks and sending the tanks out. Session with short build times. However, the large base we just saw and then someone's farming their cow months, depending on how somewhere else. You it's bananas. Go. You might want to embark on this endeavor as a team or an org. You can set up a base as an org and own it as the org. For this, there'll be permissions available, and you can assign roles and tasks. Ultimately, base building can be your main gameplay loop or a supplementary one, depending on what it is that you value. We're going to need so many clones. On that final yeah. note, yeah. I would like to say thank so you many on clones. behalf of crafting and base building teams. We've been very Honestly. excited to share with you some of the work so far and the vision we have for these systems. Yeah. But before we go, we get have, your uh, credit video. cards ready because it's coming. It's coming. The next one. <laughs> 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 no, no matter what happens, you got to pay for it. <laughs> wow. The, the quality of the graphics is just uh, absolutely. Zeus again! <laughs> Bye now. <laughs> <laughs> Where's the the, uh, the caterpillar going? You can't fit in there. Hey, wow! Look at look at look at look at look at look at that look at that look at that, look at that. <laughs> unbelievable <laughs> unbelievable dude! How are people playing any other game? All right, listen, I'm not God, Chris Roberts is. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's in Finland. Jeez. I want to see some AT bombs. Where are the AT bombs? 
<laughs> thank you. I'd just like to say thank you, especially to Kian. How are these people who don't have nukes? How do they not you have nukes? see that base again later today. Because <laughs> it's illegal. Thank you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Iran almost has a nuke, and Hello, these people. <laughs> oh, not her again. I'm Kirsten, your reporter, <laughs> and I'm here off the back of that amazing Throughout presentation with Thorsten. How are you feeling, Thorsten? Amazing! <laughs> that was an incredible view to what players can expect next from incredible, crafting and amazing. base building. Do you want to tell us a bit more about the crafting system and what players can expect to come next? We just told you, so, bitch. I think we talked a lot about that already in the presentation, but it's it's yes, a really dramatic exactly. change or an exciting change, I would say, to the game. Because we give the resources a meaning apart from just a monetary value. Now, even with the quality system that we now implement, there will be also a meaning to to scout for and like, above all, the we make billions material. on the blood store. <laughs> of course, you need more bigger variety of the materials to be able to craft the items you need and especially now with the with the tier system I think all the other developers should just give quit their day job you as the crafter or the, the the player you are to invest the time to to be the best or the specialist because something that is very important to us is that we treat it as a real profession and we have it as in parallel to all the other professions that we already have. So it's not just about making the saying. universe just... more dense, it's also about making it more interactive and making everything in it more valuable. And more meaningful. Oh, okay. yeah. So something that is also important for us is that everything that we do for, for this new feature is that we meaningfully integrate it into the game. So it all makes sense, right? So also with like the recent changes we did to the in the pledge store. In, uh, in the floor 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 that's it. That's it because you can see that the female employees have small tits. So how do we upgrade the tits? The reason why we did those changes were just because of crafting. So what impact will the crafting system have on orgs? On our tits. Well, as also mentioned in the presentation, like we want to see orgs building an empire of of crafting or of manufacturing items. We have big tits. Like, I wouldn't care if she didn't know anything. To, like, <laughs> yeah. Go to their base and buy in their particular shops the items she that has, they If she wants to go to T2 of her career. For example, FPS weapon for. <laughs> I'm guessing that'll tie in quite well to the biomes we saw yesterday as part yeah. of the core engine presentation, right? They'll use yeah, the, the extra money to pay for boob jobs for all their female what we employees. Do for crafting because it also will give us a good opportunity to spread around resources in more interesting places, like the, the giant forests you, forests you saw, right? Where your tits? For example, if you have a prospector as a miner, it might not be efficient or you might not even be able at all to go down into the trees to mine anything that might is they didn't tell us it. if we could so you need trees. to grab your roc or your <laughs> fps mining gear to actually grab the resources that you can only yeah, find i in want those to hit trees areas. with a rock so yeah we we, we will benefit <laughs> a lot <laughs> <laughs> cut logs. super excited well, drag them slowly that, drag them how over that could be like the free to play here you start naked with a rock <laughs> it looks a bit smaller, <laughs> but I, I got told it's actually bigger. So um, yeah, so it's. I really like the location. Maybe like you the, can put the logs the, on the hover the trolley. It has. I like the community area with the with the cargo crates. So I think it's 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 really nice. Yeah. Is there any specific highlights so far for your CitizenCon today and yesterday? So it's it's a very. Yeah, it's a very subjective take on it, but I really liked our presentation about the, the orcs and the social stuff because I'm, I'm part of an orc myself. So I, I really, really, really looking forward to better, better tools to organize our, our trainings, our works, our events. Do you want to give a little shout out to your org whilst you're here on camera? Yeah, you so, shouldn't be uh, allowed to play to the Aras. game. <laughs> nice one. This All right, space well, nasty. on that note, we're going to throw to Dan. <laughs> Trying to set up an organization. 
Okay. His face matches. Look, she's she looks uh, uh, Aryan. Here at Sisagon, <laughs> we are here back, and we are with some old friends. We are here with Again, Test nice Squadron. And I want to give a quick apology to my good friend O Lefty. Sorry for calling you D. Lefty oh, I've been to their forum. I've I read promise forum. it's not because D is the first letter of my name and I'm a narcissist. So that's probably why. So apologies for that. But awesome. Chrome Ninja, tell us about Test Squadron and why you guys are back here. At Compared Cisagon. to her, that What's, guy is still uh, Test Squadron cool. all about? Yeah, so Test Squadron, mm -hmm. we're the largest gaming org in Star Citizen. We've only got like 3,000 people. I think we just checked it the other day. We're just hitting over 23,100. But we're a casual ga um, gaming org and we're here giving away free stuff. We've got all this stuff on the table. Awesome. There's some cool swag here. We got coasters, we got pins, we got pens. Uh, tons of awesome stuff here at Test Squadron. If you guys are looking to join a sort of uh, friendly way to join Star Citizen, Test Squadron is the place to do it. We're going to move on. Thank you so much, Chrome Ninja. We're going to move right along to my good friend, Tom Beckhauser. Tom, how's it going? Hi, Dan. Uh, so I'm Tom Beckhauser. I'm a real life racing driver and Star Citizen Twitch streamer. And for this year, we Locus 69, Pretty Vanilla, and I decided to make a 1 to 200 scale wow. Banu Merchantman made out of resin. <coughs> Total cute. of 26 individual pieces that we assembled, <laughs> primed, Is she wearing a sanded, and painted. <laughs> um, this thing looks amazing. I mean, in addition to being a badass race car driver, you're also a badass model okay, maker. Back. This guy, okay, there's nothing he can't here. do. I see you're giving away some Banu Merchantman uh, uh, little minis. We also have the little... I think it's uh, just your hair. It's or sorry, the dark. Dark. pins, and we have the Defender mini. Hair sorry, is dark I got this mixed bag. up. Handing out the Defender miniatures and pixel art. Yes, yeah, so you gave me one the other day. This is awesome. Tom, people can find you at twitch.tv slash Tom Beckhouse. If you guys are interested in checking out more of Tom's awesome stuff, go check him out. Tom, <laughs> thank you so much for being here. It's, I mean, look at that. To take a look one last time at the BMF before he's a real we on. Uh, uh, so freaking cool. That's thank why you, he has a hot girlfriend. Over. We're going to shoot now over yeah, he to drives cars. Sam, who is here at <laughs> Sam, take it away. Good, nice oh, cars. Hi, guys. I'm here with ADI, and they have something really no. cool this year. <laughs> Welcome to the ADI it's amazing. ASOP Vehicle Retrieval System. Again, did I sound like me or um, could you give us a quick intro to what you guys are doing here? Yeah, this is the Area 18 ASOP terminal uh, and Freight Elevator terminal. Uh, we have, you know, a fully ac interactive experience here. These and, guys have a lot uh, of free time. We tied this in with our giveaways for this year. <laughs> so we have Freight Manager as well. And this is where you can take, what's this? A hacking card. We have Tiger's Claws that we've been given out. You have to search for them. You put in and you go through the hack experience. Unfortunately, Gee. ADI is an anti-piracy org and this is a mongrel hacking chip, so we don't want it. Boo, I'll go take it back to mongrel then. Come on, let's go take it back to those guys. Come on, guys. Crime never pays. <laughs> Piracy is not a real game. <laughs> <laughs> we only grief and kill for fun. Amazing. So, right, thank you. So, what are you guys showing off at your booth today? Well, we are showing off Mongrel Squad to begin with, but also also our sister orgs, as you can see, where we have the auxiliaries, the pack That's rats, racist. and the cartel, which run the prison, <laughs> but also ourselves, the premier pirate org, <laughs> the uh, Star Citizen. Thanks so much. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're going to have to move right on to the next guys. Thank you for showing off your booth, and guys hopefully we'll get to some folks to visit you throughout <laughs> the day today. So, I have bumped so into I can make an org this guy a few again. I'm back. <laughs> Hi. Awesome. Well, I'll take it from here. Thank you, Sam. And finally, for our last little bit of the community booth, for this segment, we still have a little bit more to go over today. We have Atmo. Now, you guys all know Atmo at this point. Creators of the Daymar Rally and a ton of other amazing events. They also have an event here in Manchester after the show. If you guys haven't gotten tickets for that, please go get them right now. They're going to be over at Aviva Studios after the show. Be sure to check them out. We love Atmo. They had an official you can tell place, this is uh, the best. here last year. And as it's the always, biggest. They also have out for the 2955 Daymar Rally, these awesome trophies that they're going to be mailing to the winner. These things are hefty. These things actually weigh a ton. I will absolutely wow. be trying maybe to get Thank God I don't collect physical so stuff anymore. Out, although we all saw my playing earlier today. 
so maybe not. But you guys do some awesome work. Thank you guys for all you guys do at Atmo. We're excited to see your guys' event later tonight. Be sure to check out Enter Atmosphere nice, at nice, Aviva Studios nice. later tonight if you're here in Manchester or check it out on the stream. <laughs> I think that's it for us for right now. Brilliant, we're brilliant the brilliant of the community later. Brilliant. Sam, anything else brilliant. for you? Nope. Just straight <laughs> over and back to you guys. Awesome. Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right. Guys. All right. Time to open the wallet. Crafting and base building. <laughs> fundamentally change all life in the persistent universe just a little bit right there's more of that coming later today by the way uh, before we get, before I get to my my, 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 my deep honor to introduce uh, two of my favorite people. I do want to call out these, these lovely little note cards here. You've seen many of our presenters and our hosts carrying them here. Um, I have not been carrying mine and I probably should have. Uh, this one just says don't run. This one says, thank Kat and Mandy, but also Tyler and Leah. Guys, can we get a round of applause for Tyler and Leah, please? Now, Tyler, you probably know, is our director of community. Tyler is what we call internally as a product owner. He is the product owner for CitizenCon. So everything that you see here at this event this year is touched in one way, shape, or form by Tyler Wicken. So please give a round of applause for Tyler Wicken. And because Tyler Wicken can't do anything by himself, Leah is the one who does most of the hard work. So Leah, who will never be on camera and who hates to be embarrassed, please give a round of applause for Leah, please. This one just says, learn to stretch. This one says, don't let the intrusive thoughts out. I almost lost it with that rabbit weasel thing yesterday. Uh, this one says, hi, Dad. Hi, Dad. And this one says, don't run, crossed out, don't roll on the stage, dummy. All right, so that's enough of, for, of, 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 for me. Uh, guys, our next presentation is our annual ship's presentation, this year titled Captains of Industry, being presented to you by two people who almost certainly need no introduction, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Uh, Ben Curtis was born in Manchester, no, I'm just, uh, vehicle art director Ben Curtis and, gosh. Joel Crew. Oh, I was, I was gonna do something really embarrassing, all right. John Crew, you're saved. Come on out, John Crew. You're lucky they didn't wait. You're lucky they didn't wait. Cheers, Mom. Hi, everybody. It's good to see you all again. Uh, <laughs> love you too. <laughs> uh, excited to be here. Uh, in case you don't know me and you weren't listening to Jerry there, which I do quite a lot, uh, my name's John Crew. I'm the vehicle director. Uh, my name's Ben Curtis. I'm the vehicle art director. Uh, and the clicker is not working. <laughs> oh, so if you've got technical difficulties. Technical you have, difficulties. You have to do a dance, John. <laughs> there, we oh, there we go. There we go. There we go. Good. Right. So, today we're going to be talking about the vehicles Pioneer. to build your universe. And for those a new of drawing you of the Pioneer. Watch the previous presentation, which is also about JPEG. base building and crafting. <laughs> you should be familiar <laughs> with the <laughs> construction grav cars. <laughs> <laughs> and mm. you've seen how this works. You might be wondering, well, if I've got this, why do I need some vehicles to do things? Uh, I know there's going to be some of you that will be perfectly prepared to go push this thing hundreds of kilometers out of the garages at New Babbage. But realistically, you're going to need a ship to put it in. It can't carry supplies by itself, so you're going to need to put supplies in the ship, move them. And it has small drones. And that's the key aspect there. It has two small drones on board. Uh, and drones will have sizes. OK, so yeah, basically everything you're going to be building in Star Citizen 
has its, its size class. You know, a lot of you are familiar with how we class our ships and, and a lot of other things in our game. So we ranges from you know, small all the way up to large and extra large. And our drones kind of fall into those classes as well. But you know, what does it really mean, the difference between you know, what's a small drone, what's a large drone, what's a larger than large and extra large, and so on? And basically, you know, a, a medium drone, for example, can build any structure up to a medium size. So it can build smalls, mediums, and it will be able to build small structures faster than what a small drone would. So the size makes a difference, depending on how big you want to go. But the drones also scale in... Um, they scale in numbers, in that you know, one drone can only make one structure at a time. So the grav cart's got two drones on it, so I'll be able to create two small structures. But a medium, or you know, a, if you've got a vehicle that carries multiple drones, you can craft a lot more structures, a lot bigger sizes. And that's kind of really the key to kind of like the upgrade path through the kind of drone sizes. So we've had a look at the, the small. So what, what, what's next? What do you want to build? A medium. So, I know Here some of you go. have already seen it, but, you know, this is, this is me. Come on. Yeah. So, launching today is the very first ground vehicle from Argo, the construction support vehicle. Today. Uh, so, this specialized chassis is developed to take on all the conditions on all our planets. It's a little rugged beast that really does just go everywhere. Uh, and if you're constructing a new settlement, there's two things you need. Punches you need above its weight it, class. You need supplies to supply the drones <laughs> to build it. And that's why the CSV comes in two variants. So we have the CSV FM, which stands for Fabrication Module. So this has two medium drones on board. Uh, and we built it to fit in as many vehicles as we could practically get it to fit in. So it fits in vehicles from a cutlass black upwards. It's approximately, and everyone always asks me, what ship fits in what, and I'd lose track of it all the time, uh, is about the size of a tumbrel cyclone. So if you can put a cyclone in a vehicle, you could put one of these in it. Um, obviously, two medium drones on board, and then it has an internal storage tank for resources. So it has a very small uh, version of a freight elevator built into the back of it. So you feed it one SCU crates. It absorbs them into the holding tank on board and then the drones will come back to the vehicle to refill. And it also has a size zero serial generator on board for a bit of added protection. What happens when you run out of resources? This is where the CSV SM for supply model comes in. So the second CSV-based vehicle in the game, uh, and this has a traditional four SEU cargo grid on the back. So four one SEU boxes, two two SEU boxes, one four SEU box. Depending on what you buy, you can use this to bring it and move it around. So this is the perfect companion vehicle to the CSV FM. Said that. Shield generator as well. Moves about 28 meters a second. I cannot, my brain is fried. I can't remember what that is in miles per hour or kilometers per hour. And it is available right now to drive in SC Alpha 324.2. Uh, available at playersc.csv. So now, Let's take a little closer look at the vehicle, and Ben's going to go through it. OK, so what we're seeing here is the in-game version of the CSV. It's complete with its four SEU of cargo up on the rear. And I think the CSV kind of really builds on what Argo is known for as a manufacturer. It's got those kind of like really you know, kind of hard industrial looks. And I think it helps it kind of feel at home on any build site. All of its components are you know, easily accessible. And I think the exterior is like real dominating factory. So it's kind of large all-terrain wheels. And then that's kind of backed up by you know, just simple, smooth, sleek lines. We've got the front-loaded cab that puts all the controls kind of right in the kind of you know, where the player needs them. And I think that's one of the keys to the ship as a whole, or the vehicle as a whole, sorry, is it's you know, simple, it's purposeful, it's functional. And I think that just kind of you know, just helps it to kind of feel part of that Argo family. But, but what if you want to go bigger? Bigger? Bigger. Okay. 
So, introducing the Starlancer family. So, yeah, the Starlancer is basically a whole new family of vehicles, um, you know, from, from MISC, and, and these are covering a, a range of different roles. Today, we're going to be talking about the first three, which are the build, which kind of makes sense, and that basically is for all your large structural construction needs. We have the TAC, which is going to be for people that want a little bit more um, defensive or offensive excursions in our universe. And then we have the MAX, which is a dedicated hauler, but it can still pack a bit of a punch. So we're going to take a bit of a closer look at all of them today. We're going to start off with the build. So this is the start of build from the outside. Uh, the key thing to take away here. Well, the CSV is 40 bucks. Is you'll see it has mm. the drone Very bays important. on each side, and then it has the drone resupply arms for allowing the drones to come back and resupply. Inside that room, you have the drone control center. So you have a single station inside, and this is where you control all your drones from, much like Luke showed you in the uh, previous presentation. So there are two large drones held on each side of the room, so four large drones in total. And then there are two filler stations right at the front here. And these each hold 16 SEU of capacity, which can then go and load the internal resource tank to feed the drones. Drones that will then be deployed out of their little secret garages. Uh, and they go off and do what you've asked them to do. When they need to resupply, they will come back, sit on these arms, suck up their resources that they need, carry on their day. And it's the really important thing here is that all these base building vehicles have enough storage on board to supply your drones. Obviously, if you're going to build a million things on your base, you're going to run out. But we want you to be able to have these vehicles and have knowledge that you're not going to be doing endless cargo runs initially to build your foundation your base. You'll be able to build your base and have storage on that eventually. But these all get you going in the short term. So let's have a quick go over the stats. It holds four large construction drones. It's 83 meters long, 52 meters wide, 15 tall. I uh, saw lots of rumors and chatters that people thought this was freelancer size. It is not. It is significantly larger than the Constellation and Corsair. It's almost 600i in size, so it is a, a big ship. Two S4 guns for the pilots, 16 missiles, remote turrets, and then 128 SU of cargo capacity in the build specifically. But what if you don't want to build stuff? What if, like me, you just want to burn stuff and destroy stuff? So introducing the Starlance attack. So like I say, this, this is Damn. designed to be a bit, bit more aggression into the verse. So I think the first thing you're going to notice um, is the kind of the dual man size five turrets. Now, these give much, much better kind of broadside coverage from any of the other variants. And then on top, we also have like a dedicated hangar that has been specifically designed to fit a Mirai Fury inside. And I'm sure we will see plenty of other ships try to be fitted inside. Um, Success, yeah. Or not. <laughs> yeah, we'll see. And uh, I think John's going to run you through the interior now. So, yeah, let's have a look over the TAC from uh, outside to in. So, this is the TAC in its default paint, so sort of military drab gray. Then internally, uh, obviously Ben talked about the size 5 turrets. Uh, then we have some drop seats behind, and these are on a deployable ramp, so you can do some ground assault. They will drop out down. If you're doing a bit of ground assault, chances are someone's probably going to get injured. So there is an onboard medical facility directly behind there with two tier 3 medical beds. Uh, up upstairs, obviously, there is the Fury hangar. Uh, behind that is engineering. And then forward of the hangar is the refactored habitation and mess hall area, which is specific to the TAC, just because there's so much other stuff crammed in there. We had to redo the upstairs of it, basically, to fit that in. And we'll go over the, the more normal layout shortly. OK, so yeah, to sum up, I think you know, the TAC's obviously going to bring a lot more firepower from the other variants. Um, its shield's been boosted up to uh, two, two size three shield generators. Um, it's got the med bay with the tier three med beds, uh, drop seats, it's got the hangar, and it's still able to carry up to 96 SCU of cargo. And you can secure yours today by going to play.se forward slash Starlance attack.
Okay, so I think you could kind of hopefully agree that was a pretty great kind of trailer for the Star Lancer Max. And as you can kind of see, we're, we're just putting the finishing touches on that now. Um, so, yeah, we're just getting it all done, all ready for its launch at IAE. Um, we will take a little bit of a closer look at it now. I think the Star Lancer kind of really fully encapsulates MISC's kind of ability to create beautiful ships. It's got this bulbous design that really helps to kind of convey its underlying, underlying structure and its underlying strength. I think when the engineers were trying to kind of put this together, um, they were thinking about what, what's, what's useful, what's great. And one of the things that we thought about was this deployable cargo grid that just brings the cargo down to the ground, makes it much easier for loading and unloading. And they also wanted to put the kind of the crew, you know, they wanted to put what was important for them. So they've added a lot of windows out so the crew can see out into the verse. And it's one of the things that we know people like is being able to have these kind of little windows out into space. And then above the kind of main habitation area, we've got these big skylights, and they just allow kind of like more natural light to cast down into the, the cruise area. For a bit more protection, you've got uh, eight size three missiles at front, and then a further eight on top. And these are backed up by a set of size four remote turrets, both front and rear, that give good topside coverage. And then finally, when we get to the front, you'll see we have a further set of size four gimbaled weapons. And again, these just kind of help to fill in those blind spots. I think as a whole, I think you know, the engineers or MISC have done an exceptional job in creating a vehicle that kind of fully encapsulates um, the functionality needed while still ensuring that the crew's kind of well-being and livelihood is protected. It's all in a package that kind of really dominates the sky, and I think it really shows off Mist's ability to deliver kind of quite beautiful ships. Right, so don't worry, this is not an Origin 404 moment happening here. So let's have a look inside the Star Lancer Max now. So, love it or hate it, we love it. The MISC traditional letterbox view is back. Uh, at the front of the ship, you have the pilot co-pilot seat with two support stations at the rear. These are the ones that control the remote turrets by default. Then behind that, we have the escape pod room. Four escape pods, four crew. And then behind that, we have the traversal. It's sort of a traversal room. It has a lift, goes between the two floors of the ship and goes to the exterior of the ship and then a ladder for emergency backup. Behind that is the mess hall area, so nice shared communal space for you to relax with your crew. And then we move into the four individual crew rooms, each with a double beds, so very luxurious for a spaceship, en suites for all. And at the rear of this section, we have a further two lifts. These are just internal to go between the two decks of the ship. Then at the rear, we have the main engineering. So there are some components dotted around throughout the rest of the ship, but the bulk of your components and the engineering terminal are here at the rear of the ship. So that's upstairs. Let's go downstairs a little bit. We have the main vehicle entrance and cargo entrance uh, for the rear section. Uh, this can be used as a garage, but it is also a cargo hold. Can fit vehicles up to a Ursa rover in size in here. And then on the max, we have, as you saw in the trailer, uh, the two, it's sort of one cargo lift that drops down, but it retains a walkway throughout the center of the ship. So regardless of whether your cargo is up, down, being loaded, you still have traversal front to back of the ship. Then we have the downstairs of the traversal room, which also features the airlock onto, onto the ship. And then lastly, we have the armory at the front of the ship. So if you're coming on board, leaving via EVA, leaving via that front entrance to the ground, you can stop off here, suit up, get your weapons, do the reverse coming back. And that is the Star Lancer Max. So we'll quickly recap the stats. 224 SU of cargo. 
Uh, 128 on that ventral drop platform, 96 in the rear cargo area. It has six extra VTOL thrusters uh, for all that extra mass that it's hauling. And it is available to pre-order now and will be flyable this IE uh, at play.se play science and max. And if you uh, pre-order now before IE, you will get this exclusive sapphire paint, which is in the Citizen col colors and looks super cool in my opinion. So. We have talked small drones, medium drones, large drones. What about bigger things? So, who can guess what that is? So, uh, I talked to you all quite some time ago about this in Germany, uh, and this is obviously the original concept for the Pioneer. Now, some time has passed, and whilst the core concepts of base building have remained the same at a high level, how you physically build your bases has changed slightly. So back then, you were building everything on board the ship here. You would fly your Pioneer. You'd, this is the area I want to build in. I'm going to build my base on board the ship, and I'm going to drop it down. Now, as you've seen, bases are a lot more expansive now. This doesn't work anymore. So we need to do a little bit of some reconcepting. OK, so one of the first things we really wanted to kind of solve was, was the arm. Um, you know, we know a lot more about how we're going to be constructing these structures now. And kind of the arm didn't really make a lot of sense anymore. All, all it really did was um, it made the space you need to land the ship almost twice as big as what it, it's kind of needed. And you know, we're not real spaceship engineers. We don't, we don't make real spaceships. Um, but what, what we do try and do a lot of the time is we try and take as much reference from kind of real life manufacturing as we possibly can. And I think that's really, um, it's really key to what I think Star Citizen is as, as a whole across like all the different departments in that you know, we're trying to make a, a believable universe. And if you think about the arm, and whilst I can't deny it's a cool idea, um, I think, really, from, from a, a, a manufacturing point of view, all it really does is it adds a lot of complication and a lot of manufacturing costs onto what is already a very advanced, very large, very costly ship to make. Um, so that was kind of like one of the, the kind of real first things we wanted to do. The second thing we wanted to look at was kind of um, have a little bit of a, a shift around of kind of a lot of the egress points on the ship. Um, we, we, the cargo position has moved, so we needed to kind of update that. Um, we wanted to make sure that the, the landing pad made sense and had space to kind of come into the ship. And then we also needed a way of getting things out of the ship that we will be crafting. Um, on top of that, we had a few other goals. Um, like I say, it needs to support the, all the updated kind of building mechanics. It needs to support all our current metrics. And I don't mean just character metrics, I mean all metrics, because we're going to be creating a lot of things inside this ship. Uh, we wanted it to kind of become a, a true um, self-sustained mobile base. We wanted it to kind of you know, be, um, be kind of like the cornerstone of your crafting and construction, construction ventures. And to do that, we needed to add a few extra kind of onboard facilities. So you know, a med bay, um, like I say, the crafting area, the ability to refine and or extract and refine materials. So let's have a quick look over the updated interior of the Pioneer. So at the back of the ship, we have the classic bridge, looks out over the expanse of the ship. Uh, and then top and bottom of that in this image, we have the escape pod rooms. And then leading off those is the access to the manned turrets that remain. Then going downstairs, we have the cargo uh, area at the top. Doesn't look like a lot. That's 1,000 SEU of cargo now in that space. <laughs> Next to that is the fabrication uh, control room. Uh, this is where you'll be controlling, fabricating larger vehicles and ships, as well as smaller fabrication machines next door for. You don't want to use this to build a small FPS weapon. It's a bit overkill. So we have that on board as well. 
In the center of the ship, we have a small fabrication hangar with roof and ramp egress. So if you're building a small ship on board, so things like a Nomad, you can build on board here. You'll be able to fly out the roof of the fabrication hangar. And then we have the existing small landing pad that transitions from outside the ship to inside the ship. So cargo, you can load via a new entrance that Ben's going to talk about in a second. But you can still retain the ability to land a ship on top of this ship, move it inside your ship, all those things. Uh, engineering at the rear, this is now capital components all the way around. It was a weird mix of size threes before. It's now just all capital everything. Then we have the habitation, uh, mess hall, medical area between the hangar and engineering. And then at the front, we have four extra large drones in the drone room. Um, but we don't just have some pictures like this to show you. Ben's going to go through this in a bit more detail now. OK, yeah, so we're going to have a little look at kind of like the concept and where it's at on the interior. We start out on the, you know, the interior bridge. It's very spacious, or command deck bridge, whatever you want to call it. It gives kind of really nice views out over the front of the ship. And up right up front, you've got all the uh, consoles required that you need to kind of control the ship, as well as the kind of additional remote turret access consoles. And then at the rear, we have the main kind of navigation components and some small um, engineering consoles. And kind of flanking either side, we've got these two corridors, and they lead out to uh, the man turrets that kind of sit above the bridge. And they also have all the escape pods needed um, for all the bridge crew. Like I say, we want this to kind of be a home away from home, so we have a very large, uh, comfortable habitation area. Each of the crew members, they get their own individual crew pod. And one of the nice things about this is these actually open up and they allow kind of each crew member to kind of decide like how much privacy they actually want. This is the crafting area. We've got the four kind of crafting machines. And these are right next to the, the cargo bay, the internal cargo bay. And as John says, this holds up to you know, 1,000 SEU of cargo, so it's pretty sizable. To make it a little bit easier, it's got its own dedicated cargo lift at the back that again, just kind of just simplifies that kind of getting cargo in and out of the vehicle. Down at the front, we have the drone room. Now these will be four extra large drones, so they'll be able to craft our, you know, our largest structures in game. They exit the ship out through the roof, and they're all controlled by the construction console in this area. And finally, we're just going to take a, a quick look at the crafting area on the ship. So you can see here, we've got these blast shields down that kind of protect the crew in this area from what's going on in, inside. And then as these open up, we've just, we just finished making a storm. And as, you know, as we see, there's a ramp that leads out. So you can drive any ground vehicle straight out the front. You know, between all the landing gear, and you get this really nice kind of like sense of scale as you're driving underneath out the front of the ship. And we've also got the, the top exit for any flight vehicles. And then finally, we have the, the landing pads. And this just you know, allows us for any ships that land up on deck, we can just bring them down into the belly of the ship. So that's the Pioneer. It's had quite the glow up over the years. Holds four extra large drones. Uh, and if you're interested in finding out what extra large drones can build, I highly recommend sticking around for the next presentation. Uh, it's about 20% bigger. I know the jokes, we always make ships bigger. But to fit all that in, it needed it. It can craft small ships and vehicles. And one thing we didn't show in that video is the landing gear actually have integrated ground resource extractors in. So when you find your plot, you land your ship, and you can start extracting the resources from it. <laughs> Capital components all round. And now it has 1,000 SU of cargo capacity. Uh, that, now the bad news. When base building comes out, this will not be there day one of it. But we are starting this in the next week or two. So it is in production very soon. So, yeah. 
to finish up, we'll do the classic one last thing. CitizenCon is usually about looking forwards, but we'll do some housekeeping and look at the now and a bit before. So, oh, sorry, this is Ben. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you remember last year, we kind of, we, we teased these 10 vehicle silhouettes. Um, now, these are vehicles that we were you know, planning on working on this year, and we've not quite delivered all of them yet this year. Um, but, uh, you know, we, we, we did come quite close. Um, so, so far we've delivered six. We've delivered the Pulse, the X1, uh, the Medvac, the Argo and PUV 1T, the RSI Zeus, and the rework on the Retaliator. Oh, but what about the rest? Sorry. So, all but one of these will be, will be released before the end of the year. So, the Legionnaire is the one that's going to miss out. And that's because we want to align it with hacking gameplay. Um, but the rest will be here before the, the end of the year. So, Crusader Intrepid, Mariah Guardian, and the Polaris. So. <laughs> we have a few patches between where I am today standing on stage and the end of the year. But let's start with some things that you're going to see at IE. Is that the medical terrapin? <laughs> I guess they're just teasing a few different ships at once. I'm getting confused with all the shapes. <laughs> yeah, that's Crusader.
The JPEG is about to hatch. <laughs> <laughs> it's about to become a GIF. Okay. So on top of those, those ships we've, we've talked about, um, we also worked on a number of other ships this year. So we're just going to quickly go through them before we get on to what we're doing next. So we delivered the Sulen, the Storm, the Cutter Rambler, the F7A and F7C Mark IIs. So I always get tongue twisted with these. And the F7A Mark Is. Then we also did the Santok EI, the Sabre Firebird, the Peregrine, and then most recently, the Argo Atlas. So, like last year, where we did a little tease, can't, can't just leave without teasing a little bit more. So, <laughs> Cracking. let's have a quick look at just some <laughs> emphasis on some of the vehicles that we're working on in the next 12 months. Was that the Iron Club? Oosh, I, I, I don't know. I just want to say a big thank you to all of you and a big thank you to all the vehicle team in all the studios around the globe. They give us all this really cool stuff that we can get to stand on stage and talk to you guys about. Some of them are probably hiding at the back, but I just want to say a big thank you to you all, especially for all the hard work on these recent ships. Yeah. Massive, massive thank you to everyone involved in putting these vehicles together. Right. Thank you. Thank you. I want to say the awesome, last one was a Nautilus. I some of those silhouettes so looked a little familiar. Let's mm. give it up one more time Could for the be. vehicle team. Let's hear it for the vehicle team, everybody. Woo! Call and response. We'll work on it for next year. Speaking of awesome ships, we are here at the Planet Ring booth here on the show floor at Sizzicon. These guys have some amazing models that are in prototype right now. We're going to check them out right now. Let's check out some of these awesome prototype models we have right here. Let's check those out. We're going to give our cameraman just a quick moment to check them out. I am here with Ray of Planet Ring. Right, I'm going to drop. We'll be asking See you guys a later. questions All right. about See these prototypes later. in just a second, but I want to make sure that the later. camera has time to check out the later. details on these awesome models that we're hoping to get out in the near future. Oh, look at that. That is some, that is some sexy detail work. All right, so Ray, what inspired you to make models of Star Citizen ships? Well, actually, we have been Star Citizen bankers for many years. Myself, I joined the wars in 2015, and my colleagues joined it in 2014, which is 10 years ago. It's a long way for us. And we've been specialized in sci-fi models. We have been collaborating with other famous IPs, like the films, uh, especially the sci-fi films and animations and games. So we are excited to be here as a partner of CIG to bring the citizens in the world with a, for, with a, with a beautiful ship in a Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Amazing. So how yep. long yep. does each model so my lab take for you guys and, to uh, Well, I don't we've know been working for several months for now, but and our to prototype now is still I missed the early stage. I missed the love I want to begin later. Uh, so it's roughly like five, six months You know where I missed? Okay, I'll tell you where I missed. 
that's um, all we have been they were showing everything you see here in this village. The small yeah, fabrication of vehicle, amazing. So and then ask, it crapped out, so I don't know what the medium make, one is. But oh no, no, the next, one, the next one is yeah, the, question, the little but, uh, uh, rover, right? I would say and then after the rover, that's when it crapped out. It comes to Star Lancer, is that what Star Lancer is? Yeah, oh yeah, so you missed a bunch of stuff. Yeah, there was the Star Lancer, the Pioneer. No, I saw the Pioneer on my phone, so I missed the beginning of the Star Lancer. So the Star Lancer is the large fabrication vehicle, right? Yeah, and there's also a variant that is more for, I guess, assault. But can the variant, like, build stuff? I don't think so. It didn't look like it. And the finished version, we have it right. printed for you, we have it assembled for you, and we have did they some speak about, layers, uh, did they say how much money uh, it will cost? And some uh, it's out on the store now. Fine quality. Amazing, oh. and so we're actually going to show check. these really quick. I think one of them is going out at the, IE. Uh, details over. We're going to actually throw it over to so Sam. Is anything Let's flyable now? No, nothing is flyable right now, right? Ring. While the, really the small Argo vehicle, here. the one Let's that carries cargo. Thank you, Ray, again. That's usable right now? Yeah, yeah. Hi guys, I'm back at but the how did they booths, explain, and I'm how over did here they explain, with Ultima. Could you give us a brief intro for the guys watching at home to what you guys do? Absolutely, I'm Scalian from Ultima Energy. We're uh, the leading provider that, of fuel products and services they're selling here in the this vehicle, even though you can't do anything with it. Well, they're, they're selling the one that can uh, carry cargo, you know, like Ultima. the mule. Energy. They're not selling the, the other one. As well. so hit us up there. Okay, I see, I see. So, but did they, did so they give an excuse for this, or did they just paper over it? Oh, yeah, I don't think they said anything about it. They just said, hey, it's... Available, Jared talked a little bit about I guess. you guys earlier today. <laughs> okay, so okay. How have you okay. found the convention so far? What's your Oh, yeah, and bit? did they say, oh, that's man, another thing I missed. Amazing. Did they say uh, when the base building stuff so will be in? I mean, I'm an interest, uh, uh, next myself, year? So oh, the, the what? The big building stuff? In, uh, no, I mean, any building uh, at all. Uh, when is it going to be in the game? The I think they said next year. Thank you so much for being here. And if you guys haven't already, do come check out their booth because it is really amazing. Okay. It's amazing. Amazing. And I am here right on the end of our amazing community booth area amazing. with our Avangard guys. So, Avangard, would you mind introducing yourselves and what you guys do? Yeah, absolutely. We are a PMC organization. We do PvP both in the sky and on the ground. We also a trading division where we trade uh, rare guns, rare armors, and everything. Uh, our goal is to have uh, at least nice. 100 members, but because we value, value people below quantity. We want to create a legacy altogether. When I create this organization... Why you I people below quantity? <laughs> what does that mean? Mm -hmm. I just planted a seed for a tree. Maybe I will never see the fruits, but I want to create a legacy. A people seed for need a tree to fruit? What is he talking about? <laughs> Especially when being a healthy community and having fun all together. Amazing. Thank you so amazing. much. Right. Let's move on over amazing. to the other side. She didn't say amazing, so she didn't think it's amazing. My partner in crime, Dan. Was it, was it nutty enough? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it sounded immigrant. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Look at that awesome shit model they have here. It's even better than the one they had in LA last year. Guys, quick elevator pitch. What do you guys here at uh, for Ibirium have here at CizenCon this year? Well. We at CitizenCon this year, we brought another one of our one-to-five scale angles. This one is actually in the Imperium <laughs> colors. The ISS I mean, most of them, to be honest. Their name for our flagship by our members. And then also over here, we have uh, one to scale. You put a Boeing up there? Uh, Bengal Kungari Battle Group that was made by our, one of our members that we're going to be donating to, to uh, Cloud Imperium and to Chris Roberts. That is amazing. You guys have made some amazing. Awesome stuff here. Amazing. We're really happy to have you guys <laughs> awesome showcase stuff here at CizenCon. We're going to move on. Thank you guys at Imperium so much. And we're going to move right along. Thanks, guys. Next up, we have Black Star Initiative. If you guys are interested in And here we have the call, the genocidal. Force, the weekly events. Uh, <laughs> place to check out, guys. Again, the quick the hateful. Pitch. What is Black Star uh, about? What do you guys have here at It's Star amazing. Star they, they would never amazing. allow us in. It's all about helping other people in the org, uh, getting to PvP battles, and <clears> also doing security and protection. Now, you, if we try to have a booth, uh, someone will come and say, oh, don't uh, I see Calm is a scammer. But then maybe they will say, oh, yeah, yeah, let, let him come in. <laughs> 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 right at home. <laughs> <laughs> 
coasters and patches. So if you ever need anyone to do protection for your bases that are coming soon, look to us. No one's better. And if, if you want to get good at PvP, uh, we have daily <laughs> trainings that we can provide to you. We have uh, a lot of stuff uh, to do. Uh, we have a civilian division. Uh, if you're not that much into combat, but even they get trained. <laughs> I was going to say, so you know we have the black guy protector bases. Awesome. Thank you guys for the black guy. <laughs> I'm always happy to have you. We're going to move right along to one more final community booth. This is our last one of the show we have here. Guys. CizenCon is sometimes a crazy show with lots of cuts, lots of cameras, and no one knows that better than Hubnet. Hubnet is an awesome news roleplay uh, group, but I think you guys can say it better. Tell us all about Hubnet. All right, so Hubnet is our attempt at uh, making content for the citizens in the verse in 2954. So not for you players, but for the players' characters. So we make uh, a full feature-length movie like Overclocked, we make animated, animated series like Jack of Spades, and our news report, wow. Hubwire, is meant to report on uh, events that are going on in the verse. And uh, Joel can tell you a little bit more about uh, what we do. Yeah, so if you're looking to create a project or get involved in a project, you can join our Discord, sign up as a role. You can be a voice actor, a filmmaker. Whatever your talent is, we can use you. Uh, we're effectively Netflix in the verse, so come check us out at Hubnet. Awesome. Thank you guys at Hubnet. Guys, this is it for me and Sam. You can see here those guys are um, comfortable speakers. They're hosts. more comfortable and than those Sam, two clowns. Words? Yep. <laughs> um, no, just amazing job, guys. Everything in this community booth, every all of the amazing. Have worked so hard to make sense of It's happen. amazing. You guys are amazing. So hope you have an amazing rest of your Every time she's amazing, she gets from a thousand, thousand bucks from uh, Chris Robert. <laughs> Thank you guys. Thank you, Jared. Goodbye. Goodbye. Amazing. I'm so okay. amazed right now. It's the time. Amazing, time, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> time and before we get this started we're doing a lot of things here I want to do some personal thanks to myself okay so first I want to thank all the developers I was amazed the that the uh, pioneers in development for you yeah their amazing same work that well, I wasn't expecting the last year for Star Citizen and Squadron amazing. 42 so please <laughs> a round of applause for the developers It is not easy to stand on this stage in front of 4,000 people, in front of tens of thousands of it's people not easy at home, being cheesy. and the hundreds of thousands who will clip and ask you to open and your replay wallet. it and cut it into other <laughs> content videos uh, for years and years to come. So thank you so much. I want to do a couple individual call-outs, though, because it's, it's important to me, and I'm on stage right now, and you're a captive audience. I want to call out Nick Piers. Nick Piers from the, from the uh, Characters and Creatures presentation. Ten days ago, we lost our main presenter. He didn't die or anything, he just couldn't make the trip. Nick stepped in with only ten days to prepare that amazing armor specialization presentation that you saw. So Nick, you're, you're a champion. Too. Thank you so much, stepping at the last minute. <laughs> Benoit and Ian. Benoit and Ian took the reins and, and delivered multiple presentations this year. You may only see them talking in this presentation or this presentation. You're going to see Ian in this one here, like this. But their work behind the scenes getting all of these presentations up to the standard that they're required was amazing this year. So Benoit and Ian, you don't have to clap for this one. This is just for me. Thank you so much, Benoit and Ian. All right, you can clap. That's fine. You might have noticed we went on ISC hiatus a couple weeks ago. Uh, we went on a hiatus a little earlier than normal because we took the ISC gameplay capture team and we dedicated them to the work of CitizenCon for the last almost six weeks. Every year at CitizenCon, the devs spend their time creating their footage for you, their showcases for you, and many of them still did. But, it, but the amount of work it takes takes, that away, takes them away from the work of actually creating the game. Come back. So our ISC gameplay capture team really stepped up this year for the first time in CitizenCon history and helped folks create the videos. Those amazing looks at Nyx, those amazing looks at Castra, the amazing looks at the Sandworm and stuff. So I want to call out Will, Dave, Toby, Alex, and our newest member, Thomas. Hi, Thomas. Thank you so much, guys. 
they had never participated in a citizen con before, and I think they were a little surprised at first at the sheer amount of work that goes into doing this, but they stepped up and delivered some amazing stuff, the last of which you're going you're to see some in this next presentation. Uh, and then our last two groups of people I want to present, I want to, I want to share. Are they back there? Wave if you're back there. You guys ready? I can't see anything. All right, I hope, I'm vamping a little bit until Rich Tyra gets into place. I could hide it from you, but I'm not. So the last groups of people I want to, I want to thank, well, let me tell you a story real quick. When I'm back there, and folks are coming up to me and they're thanking me for this and thanking me for, the, uh, for doing ISC, for doing SEL, for putting this together on the stage today. I'm struck by two things every time I'm thanked. One is that I can't do any of this without you. It's, there is no game project in the world that does a weekly behind the scenes docu-series each and every week, and then turns around and does a live talk show the next day after it. And that's only made possible because you guys keep tuning in, you guys keep watching, you guys keep supporting, you guys keep making relatively positive comments in the, in, <laughs> about me. It's, it's, yeah, I, uh, I don't think I'm ever gonna shave my face again. But, Sorry, I just wanted to see what I looked like. You know, it's like, I'm like, oh, that's what you look like. All right, I agree with the people. Let's bring it back. Uh, and then last but not least, <laughs> there is one person who makes it possible for me to do everything that I've done here. I've been here for 10 years. I've produced seven Citizen Cons. I've produced uh, three Gamescoms, uh, a PAX or two, and a couple digital stuff. And of course, ISC and SCL every single week. And Really, after your support, the only reason I get to do this week in and week out and have these big moments like this is because of the same guy who makes it possible for all of us to do our jobs. So I'd like to thank, where, where's the camera? There you go. I'd like to thank Chris Roberts. Chris, thank you. Thank you for, thank you for not thinking Sandy was crazy when she hired me. Thank you for saying yes to so many things I want to do and for not saying no or getting angry when I don't ask. So thank you so much. Uh, I, am, I do operate a lot on a let's just do it and see if I get in trouble afterwards thing. So is that Chris there? Are you ready? All right. So with that, yes, he's, he's, uh, he's angry now. All right. So without further ado, let's get to our final presentation of the night. The star is my destination. I introduce to you by the one and only Chris Roberts. Hey, um, well, I hope you had a great day yesterday. And uh, by the way, there's a, uh, a perfect run through that Rich did immediately after the show. He went back to the office ran it through, no crashes, no nothing, it's up on YouTube. Uh, and by the way, that's a dedication of Rich, is, is, is like, okay, I'm gonna get it done properly, and he did it, and it looks great, and it doesn't have any screen tearing, because there was some screen tearing, there was a technical glitch in the setup yesterday, so. Anyway, so, anyway, watch that. And if you're doing comparisons to the old stuff, compare with that video, not, not from the stream. Um, but, anyway, I hope you guys liked this morning. There was the base building and the crafting and the ships you'll be able to do it. I mean, for me, the ability to sort of create your own place somewhere in the verse, find the perfect spot for you to make your home or harvest resources, uh, it totally changes the dynamic of what the game will be in terms of exploration and people spreading out. And I think putting roots down in the verse. So I can't wait till we get that in there. I mean, that's one of the things that makes me incredibly excited because I, I think it will just add so much to a living, breathing universe. Um, but that is a perfect example of Star Citizen, how it's grown over the last 12 years because we definitely did not have that on the initial Kickstarter or the pitches that we were doing. Um, and, you know, Star Citizen is a living game. I mean, we're constantly always adding content and features and tech. 
As you can see, we're constantly upgrading you know, what we're doing on the graphics side, making it better and always improving it. And even after we would consider it a released or a ship game, not an alpha game, we will still be doing that. So it's just a, it will be a living game. We'll never do Star Citizen 2.0. It will always be sort of Star Citizen that will continue to grow. It won't be like, oh, we're going to do Destiny 2 after Destiny 1. It will just be a living, growing product. <laughs> Same for us. Right? I don't mean that. I don't mean that as a. I don't mean that as a knock at them. I'm just. I just mean that <clears throat> in today's world, you you constantly. It's interesting that he mentions, things. you know, other uh, uh, companies because but, other companies don't do that. They the, don't mention them. The big them. question really is: At what point would we, at CIG, what point would I, what point would the rest of the team consider Star Citizen ready for everybody, not just you guys out here who hey. are beautiful, wonderful, hey, what's up? early hey. adopters, willing to put up with up? bugs, jankiness. Uh, you know, not a great new player experience. We know all those things are things that we want to fix and improve. And we want a game that everyone can just get into at the beginning, understand it, have fun. Cash grabs. You know, pulls you into it and then has a huge amount of depth. So Scam. the question is, what is that? Scam uh, And that is what we call Star Citizen 1.0. It's something that we've been talking and looking and designing and thinking a lot about over the past X number of years. How many yards can I get from thought, the scam? You know what? What we should do <laughs> is, I think, half our sort of initial stuff is from a long time ago that you've seen, and then occasionally we'll talk about things we're doing in, uh, you know, Inside Star Citizens or SE Lives. But we're like, okay, let's tell everyone the marker. This is what it is, Star Citizen 1.0. When we hit this, this is what we consider we're ready to go wide, you know, Everybody in the world can get in, play it, whether you're hardcore or casual, have fun, play in the verse. Full on porn. Have a great time. And so that <laughs> is on. what we're going to tell you Hardcore today, procreation again. Star Citizen 1.0. That Big metaverse porn. That we'll stop That's that where the slave we'll cells come in. Grow and build and add things. <laughs> you wait for the so <laughs> fishing is not on Since there are no females this, playing this game, you will have sure to hunt them. In the uh, world, no, there will be I'm NPCs. Sure it will be Make sex dungeons, paint on the radiator. <laughs> but that is the example. We're going to tell you what the marker is. And, uh, you know, to do that, Actually missed what you just Rich said. Tyra, who's our senior uh, game director, is going to come out with a few of our other directors and we will lead you through what 1.0 will be. So without further ado, Rich Tyra. How many directors do you have? All right, Rich. Did you say yeah. Squadron 42 is coming out after 1.0? Hello, Citizen Khan. No. <clears throat> oh, it's going out, so out in 2026. My name 20, is Rich 26. Tyra, and I'm the Senior Game okay. Director for Star Citizen and Squadron 42. Now, I've been at Cloud Imperium for many years, and I've read many, many Spectrum and Reddit posts. <laughs> and one consistent question I always see is, what type of game is Star Citizen? And I've read many, many answers. It's a PvE game. You can see how it's comfortable the guy is. What about non-combat? Ultimately, it's all three. Three types of players, one universe. So how do we connect those players to create a cohesive game, and not just a set of features bolted together? And it comes back to that elegant, simple question. What type of game is Star Citizen? Well, today, we're going to find out. OK, so before we get stuck into Star I'm Citizen I'm going to call Icicle on the stage. I think we'll I need explain. to <laughs> Firstly, what about 4.0? Where does that fit in? Well, 4.0 is the patch that contains server meshing and pyro. And fundamentally, it's an alpha development patch, which means it's adding further tech, features, and content to our alpha version of the game. Today, though, is beyond 4.0, all the way to 1.0. And the big difference is that 1.0 is the full release of the game. OK, so what does that mean? How will it be different to a normal patch? Well, firstly, let's look at the 1. The 1 means we're committing to higher base performance yeah. and minimal bugs. No longer will we reference what does the, the point game mean? is in development. This will be a fully what is the meaning of life? and polished experience. <laughs> it means fully rounded gameplay loops, 
from new player experience, the zero is an extra story zero in Chris and game bank content. <laughs> and crucially, it means no more resets between patches. It's a true... It's a true... The grind will be real. Universe. The grind will be real. <laughs> so if that's the one, what about the dot zero? No more wipes, because well, we have bidet now. Important. It means we're still committed okay. to continued development, with new content and features being planned post 1.0. But those features will no longer be tier zero. We'll be committing to a higher benchmark of quality for each pass, each patch, and most importantly, it's a moment in time. <laughs> if there is a content, feature, or star system that we've mentioned in the past uh, that is not in 1.0, it develops time loops, time travel it tech. Will come later. Oh. stuck in that moment in time forever. 1.0 is more than just a number change. It's the beginning of a new phase of development of the game. A new era. OK, so we know what the one is and the dot zero. But before we move on, I want to address one important point. And for this, we need to go all the way back to the beginning. Here we are, the Kickstarter. As a backer myself, it brings back memories. Is anybody here and who was in the Kickstarter? A lot of who pledged? Goals. No. And one yeah, of those I did. Goals was you did. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. truly amazing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I was, yeah. Crazy to think about. So you have a two, 2012 but, account. And there is a I bar. do, yeah. The star systems and old are not cool the star shit. systems of today. I do, yeah. I checked. They were based on a lot of the stuff that came out. Freelancer model. They were unexplored. How much planets, are you selling it for? <laughs> isolated and small landing zone and had automated landings. I don't need it if you want it. And we all know care. how that went. You have to tell us what there is there. You have to show to us. To give you an picture. idea, Stanton yeah, yeah, yeah. had I'll four points of interest, and the entire 100 systems only had 90. I POIs. think Chev also has an old account. Compare uh, that no. to Stanton today. And we have uh, chef, 1, chef, you. Oh, chef, yeah, yeah. 26 points of interest. And that is going to be dwarfed once we start using the Starkitect tool you saw yesterday. <laughs> so where does that leave us for 1.0? Well, we will not be launching with 100 star systems because the game we have today was not just the game that was pitched back then. Scam. It's more rich, <laughs> it's more diverse, and fundamentally, you'll be getting a whole lot more. I don't care. I mean a lot more. My hunter systems are okay, good the fuck so out. So now I have to find what 1.0 is. There's people who actually say Let's this in the cool comments. <laughs> yeah, there's people Star who just want dogfighting. Its very nature, it's a sandbox MMO. <laughs> yeah. Today, I think it's a dogfighting game. I want to find I wanna be in corridors and roll on the do floor. Do and how to do it. <laughs> no, they, game experience. no, they just want, want Arena Commander. Or Salvager. You have to know those professions exist. You have to know what I think we need more dancing. Gameplay. Dancing. And you have to rely yeah. on outside I think we need pooping, on pooping mechanics. As it is now, the game is not set yeah, up scum. to help you. Vomiting, shitting, <laughs> so we're going to I've been asking for that for ages. You know, a nervous system that connects all the professions, ships, and content together. And to do this, we're going to add Quanta. a main story. Tony Z. <laughs> To help. Oh. <laughs> A cinematic experience. To help new and existing players, to help discover all the exciting features and content we have, to take them on a journey of discovery of what the game has to offer. This story will become the spine of the universe and help onboard players with understanding how to play the game and understand what's available to them. <coughs> this story will also introduce each of our guilds and what professions we have to offer. First quest, like kill United 10 copies. Like resource workers, our core <laughs> industrial guild, which supports two of our main professions, mining and salvaging. They also support many other features and professions, like repair technicians. Rats, the game needs rats. And builder. Yeah. In the sewers, guilds are hugely yeah, yeah. important in, in Star Area 18. And as you know by now, <laughs> guilds are comprised of many and then very factions. big rats in a swamp. <laughs> as you work for each of these factions, you will gain guild reputation. You can then use this reputation as a currency to purchase guild-affiliated rewards, like ships, 
blueprints, and items. And each guild will have a unique inventory of what they offer. Alongside economic growth, guild reputation will become a core progression of the game. And to talk more about guilds space and our stations. main story, I'd like stations? to introduce David Haddock onto the oh, wow. stage, our very own narrative director. Thank you, Rich. Hello, Citizen The narrative How's guys have the best job. They just write text. <laughs> awesome. So, yes, 1.0 is very exciting. And, it's and they say I'm a developer. <laughs> they, they say I'm a developer. They're just trying to text. Inject a massive amount <laughs> the, of the ID guys. The but we're looking to do that in several of ways. Now, Rich introduced the main story. So let's get into it. What exactly is that? <clears throat> First, it's a narrative experience. This will be a crafted story through the star systems and professions of the Star Citizen universe. You're fighting for trans rights. Taking an exciting adventure that will finally <laughs> kick off the growing <laughs> tension between Earth and Terra. Yeah, yeah. It will be NPC driven. So while Squadron 42 will always be the place to go for AAA cinematic adventure, we're bringing a lot of the techniques that we learned from that to capture and build a cast of dynamic characters, some of which may be familiar, for both this story and the PU. And the main story is also designed to be sort of like a tour bus structure where you can hop on and hop off. Every player who has his own story, so there will be a million so stories. We're not also requiring you to do it. it. So With if you a new procedural one, story generation you thing, you can do that. <laughs> or maybe you want to put the story on hold so you can go explore a new facet of gameplay that you just discovered. Gameplay. Go for it. The point is that you can complete it at your own pace. So that's the what. So why do you want to do this? What's the motivation to want to go on this ride? Like Rich said, for new players, it's a great way to ease into sort of the vast lore that we've been developing over 12 years. The gameplay, the locations that the game has to offer, and also give you a sense of up sto upcoming stories that are about to come. But you all, you've been playing Star Citizen for years. You probably know the lore better than me. So what's in it for you? Now, of course, we'll have rewards along the way as you complete missions and whatnot, but we're finally going to offer a big prize for completing the story. What? Citizenship. Okay, Chris Roberts has bought an island and he's starting his own country. <laughs> <laughs> so, for many of you already know this, but for the uninitiated in the UEE, there are citizens and there are civilians. Citizens are members of the population who have demonstrated a commitment to bettering the empire and as such are given benefits that civilians just don't have. Now, what those, those uh, differences have been have been debated in the community over years. 1.0, we're finally going to answer that debate. I won't get into the full list of benefits that we're going to offer, but can reveal that one of them will be around land ownership. Citizens We'll be able to purchase land anywhere in the UAE and enjoy the security that comes with it. But civilians you can have will slaves. have a couple restrictions as to which systems and which planets they can buy on. You, you can rape. So that's the why. That's how procreation creation happens. That's how you make include it. five star sure. systems. This story is going to weave you through all of them. But where exactly are you going to go? It's linked to the taming First, mechanics. First, you rape. Which needs very little introduction. <laughs> Uh, I'm sure you're all very intimately familiar with these four corporate-run worlds. But since I do lore, I figure I could take the next hour and just walk through each one of these. But I'm kidding. Uh, we've also got Pyro, land of the lawless. A volatile star at the center of the system is the perfect metaphor for the constant struggle between the gangs and survivors trying to hack out in existence here. If you saw Ian's location presentation yesterday, then you know that he reintroduced Nick's system. There's another unclaimed system that's currently home to the People's Alliance, a wannabe independent government formed during the Messer era, but now struggling with the burdens of governance, a growing outlaw presence, and a new threat on their doorstep from Vandal raids. Ian also made another big announcement of our fourth system, Castra. Situated along the former Perry Line, this was a key strategic system to launch an attack if the Cold War between the humans and the Xion ever escalated. So that's four. Do you guys want to know five? Yeah. Oh. 
There we go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're finally doing it. Considered by many to be the new jewel of the empire, Terra has been a shining star against the more imperialistic tendencies of Earth, even in the darkest days of the Messer regime. Now, many believe that Terra should be the new center of the UEE. I don't know how you all feel about that. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of division. But that's our starting five. Each system and each planet will be featuring the massive level of outposts, POIs, stations, biomes and exploration options that we've been perfecting with Stanton and Pyro, and you've been seeing in some of the other presentations this weekend. But we're adding one more level. We're also going to be adding location stories. Now, these will be short, NPC-driven missions sprinkled across our landing zones and cities that will exist outside of the main story, but will help provide an additional bit of lore and character to the location that they take place in. So that's our main story. Let's talk more about the guilds that Rich mentioned. First, a quick recap. Guilds act as a governing body for clusters of professions and factions with a reputation and progression system that will offer rewards the more you work for them. And I want to call out two things. One, I'm not going to have time to dive into all of the missions that you're going to see on this board. But just know that every mission type is either in the 1.0 roadmap or already in production. And second, we're also looking to move missions away from the Moby Glass whenever possible. Sure, it will always be an easy way for us to get additional game content in, but we want you talking with people. So, so to aid that, we're going to be adding characters to represent the factions that you'll be working for that will help sell their personality. Now, some, they'll still interact with you via the written word, but some will call and check in on your performance. And others, you may have to meet in person from time to time. So let's walk through them. Here we have the first guild that Rich showed, the United Resource Workers. Whether you're eager to earn credits, mining valuable resources from remote corners of the universe, sifting through detritus to try and salvage some valuable components, or even just acting as a technician, you'll find plenty to do with employers like Shubin Interstellar, United Wayfarers Club, and more. Next, you have one of the oldest unions in the UEE, the Interstellar Transport Guild. This will be the go-to place for everybody looking to make their fortune hauling and trading. Some of the factions that many of you already work for now, such as Ling Family Hauling, Redwind, and FTL. And we're going to be adding something special for the daredevils out there, the Imperial Sports Federation. Huh. Parkour. <laughs> Death Race. Oh, Arena Commander. So aside from the usual racetracks that are Enough both legitimate arena. and illegitimate, we're actually going to be leveraging some of our existing mechanics to build new sports and provide an outlet for all you Murray Cup enthusiasts, Cargo Olympians, and competitors to see just who's the best out there. For those who dream of exploring, I'm sure we have a couple here. OK, so capturing is going to be in. nice. We have the Academy of Sciences that was brought up yesterday in the social uh, presentation, if you saw that. This is a science guild that will include factions like the Imperial Cartography Center, who will task you with a variety of missions to better understand our universe, such as sending Bombing you into animals. a nebula, the International deep Criminal scams, Court, <laughs> or finally seeing what's at the bottom be of the Planetary Canyon. We're going to have a new faction called High Point Wilderness Specialists, who will offer Carf missions associated <laughs> yeah. with the various Carf fauna <laughs> that we're starting to get into the game from population control missions to harvesting Carpet. specific resources for research. <laughs> population now, control. I we like have to uh, do combat, but <laughs> our combat guilds were doing something a little different. Now, previous to this, these are all of our profession guilds. But for our combat guilds, they operate a little differently. See, these two are diametrically opposed to each other. Who are guilds? So once you pledge allegiance to one, the other marks you as an enemy. On the lawful side, we have the Mercenary Guild. Once you pledge allegiance to one, you have to get like a second Ekron account. Security, the Bounty yeah. Hunters Guild, and even some military contractors. Well, I would guess at some point, so, you know, you can have multiple pulling, game packages on the same account, right? You're a team of specialists to go assault a ground That's, base. Yeah, they mentioned multiple Hunting down an elusive right. yeah, criminal. Yeah. Or putting together a recon run to drum up some intel. Mercenary Guild's got you covered. 
On the flip side, we have the council. Now, this is a shadowy group comprised of representatives from various gangs, syndicates, and outlaws who mandate criminal activity throughout the verse. You'll be able to throw in with rough and tumble gangs like the Headhunters and the Dead Saints, or work your way up to join highline criminal syndicates like the Atonies or the Drop Kings. But remember, Capture the underworld people. is a dangerous place run by greed and power. So race mercenary racing. guild reps might not be the only people you have to worry about. As can, the syndicates are be always a professional racist? loyal soldiers who will hurt their yeah. competition and tip the scales of power in their favor. So as you can see, it's going to be a universe of exciting storytelling opportunities for you to undertake in 1.0. But one more thing, we're also going to revitalize our social behavior. Industrial athletes. To make the populations not only feel more alive and reactive, <laughs> and off chairs, but better reflect the tone and flavor of the areas that they're inhabiting. We want to see the Our people of Lorville slowly trudging through the streets, overburdened by the ruthless contracts, just as much as we want to see the tourists of Orison gleefully moving from attraction to attraction. And all of this, this is what's going to make Star Citizen be the experience about pro set boxing? out to make. A diverse universe with a rich tapestry of stories, characters, and experiences for you to live in. So this to is supposed to come before 2030? To player progression, I'm going to turn it back over to Rich Tyron. <clears throat> two years, in two years you'll be ready. <laughs> Smash that. Thanks, Dave. Okay, so we have a main story to connect the universe. We have all the guilds and their associated professions and we have location stories to give the world depth and life. Crucially though, we have a new core progression in the game, guild reputation. But what about our other core progression in the game? The economy. So as we've discussed before, we'll be implementing a star sim powered dynamic economy that will automatically adjust the in-game prices based on player activity. But for credits to actually matter, though, we need to credit have an flow in and out into our out bank account as well out as of in. your bank account. <laughs> this means transactions <laughs> such as repairing, refueling, and restocking need to have value. If everything is too cheap and the money coming into the economy is too great, we'll have massive inflation. And this is where taxes and insurance come in. So you need to print more money. <laughs> <laughs> Then you have price control. Then you have price control. <laughs> we need communism. We'll this, is, is this, is this is the Kamala conference. Tax, or? As part of Death of the Space Man. And security tax for your base that will cover the cost of planetary shield tech. Of paint tariff. Insurance, shield on the other hand, will be split between medical insurance, which covers your hospital imprints, and probably the most important one of all, Jesus. ship insurance. Oh, okay. <laughs> Now, as we have Death of a Spaceman, we, have LTI, we also though, need so. Death of a Spaceship. <laughs> yeah, but LTI Using only calls the, the base hull, significant. not the components right now, and all, example, all the other stuff. Scam! 90% yeah. of all claims the in the verse are for <laughs> ships the court that have not been destroyed. <laughs> and this is where ship insurance and our new warranty mechanic comes in. First up, we'll have three tiers of insurance. What? With level one being chassis insurance. Level two, chassis and component insurance. Okay. And level three, chassis, component, and decorations insurance. LTI covers what? Four is <laughs> LTI is only for and the now, base chassis, it's only level by one. Itself, We'll LTI is only for the decorations. Based on the wear and age of your ship. Insurance. I think you, you want to listen to this bit because it's important. Insurance with a warranty, though, will give you back a new ship, plus any other equipment or decorations based on the tier of insurance you had. OK, so this is the bit you need to listen to. All ships bought on the pledge store will come with a permanent warranty and their appropriate insurance.
Pay us, pay us, pay us to win. Pay this us. means you will always <laughs> get your ships back if they're attributed to your account. Other ships, on the other hand, will require a transferable warranty, and these are rare. You'll be able to earn transferable warranties in game, such as by completing the main story, as an example, and apply them to any of the ships you own. But there will be a cooldown for transferring it between ships, so choose wisely. Now, what about claim timers? It's another fun topic. And getting your ship back without a claim. Well, we want claim timers to be proportional to the crafting timers. This means it's more beneficial for you to go back and get your original ship. For this, we're going to be introducing a shuttle ship, just like a courtesy car. You'll be able to claim the shuttle at no extra cost to most locations and then fly it back to your original ship. Once back in your ship, the shuttle will automatically... It'll be like Dark home. Souls, going back and get your soul. <laughs> <laughs> if your ship has been legitimately lost, though, then you'll need to claim it back. And as we'll be increasing claim timers, this will mean some ships will take longer than others. With starter or small ships always being readily available. And larger capital-sized ships taking a long time. So it's always better to try and get your ship back if possible. OK, so we've talked about our two core progressions. But what does that mean to you as a player? Well, firstly, it means we have a framework where we can start creating cyclical gameplay loops. But what are they? Let me show you. OK, so right now in live, if you have a prospector, you probably enjoy mining. And the reward for mining is credits and the enjoyment of the activity. But in 1.0, you might be mining for a whole different reason. And this is where cyclical gameplay loops come in. Firstly, Let's add all the manufacturers and ships in. I'll just give you a moment to take that in, because there's a lot. I actually had to ask them to take the variants out, because it didn't fit on this slide. <laughs> and let's zoom all the way into the prospector, a stalwart of the mining community. But let's say I really fancy acquiring a military Mark II Hornet. Let's go on a simplified journey of how I could get one. Firstly, I know I won't be able to buy it, as it's a military ship, so I'm going to need to craft it. That means I will need the fabrication hangar blueprint. Luckily, I can earn it by doing mining missions to gain rep with the United Resource Workers, and I already have the perfect wow, ship, so awesome. my trusty prospector. With blueprint in hand and some excess credits, I can now purchase a small plot of land on Stanton and build my fabrication hangar. Step one, complete. Now I need to grab the Mark II Hornet blueprint. For this, I need mercenary rep, and more importantly, a combat ship. With that in mind, I will do a few more mining contracts to earn it's enough so more complicated than to purchase uh, Rust, a Mustang so... from the dealership. Now I can start doing combat pilot missions for the mercenary guild, so I can unlock the Mark II Hornet blueprint. OK, step two of our simplified loop is complete. I have the Mark II blueprint but I need the resources to craft it. So I come full circle back to my prospector, but this time I'm mining for resources instead. As you can see, this closes the loop. No longer am I mining just because I like it, and there's nothing wrong with that, but now I am mining for a purpose and for multiple reasons. For credits, for reputation, for resources, for blueprints and ultimately as a stepping stone to crafting my own ships to enjoy other professions. And this is just one of many loops. This is the core of Star System 1.0. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. 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 Player set goals that weave between sandbox gameplay and the soft framework we are adding that give meaning and progression to our professions and features. It's providing the framework for motivation to play the game. 
That's the journey, though. What about the destination? So Dave has already discussed citizenship and the main story, so let's collapse that for now. Let's talk about endgame content. The content that is designed for experienced players and keeps them engaged. Basically, everyone in this room. <laughs> so how does that look in 1.0? Firstly, we'll have open world content, including missions, group missions, and server-wide events, like we have today, but tailored to end game players. <clears throat> While the sandbox element of Star Citizen will allow for large-scale battles, we also want to provide challenging instanced content that will take full advantage of not only multi-crew ships, but fleets of ships. And you kind of know how we do that, right? You saw that yesterday. <laughs> and as you progress through the guilds, you'll be able to accept high-level contracts from government agencies who will offer prototype and military blueprints as rewards. These missions will require the full coordination of multiple players and an assorted fleet of capital, support, and fighter ships. You will finally be able to become Amazing. the Admiral of the Fleet. <laughs> I said that without a without armada armada joking. From your hollow globe, <laughs> which, yes, is a feature included in 1.0. What the fuck? <laughs> and at the end, now you must defeat me, Chris Roberts. <laughs> we will also in, be offering more specialized on In your battle, your, that see you into the your... depths of distribution centers <laughs> and municipal works in small, tight-knit squads in that provide an outlet for our more FPS-focused players. On top of all this, we'll see a dynamic the strategy player thing powered is by the biggest thing. It happened, I While told you it happened. While will be the yeah. driving force in our dynamic economy, it will also track player and AI activity and dynamically spawn events based on their actions. For example, if it tracks large amounts of resources being moved from one home location to another, it will have a chance to spawn pirates to intercept. All this combined will provide just a portion of the end game experience. And I'd love to delve deeper, but that's for another day, as we still have a lot to show. So we've discussed non-combat professions and guilds, cyclical gameplay loops, and end game PvE content. But what about PvP? Yeah. What about player versus player content? As you know, 1.0 will contain five star systems, three of these being lawful in Stanton, Castra, and Terra, and two of them being unlawful in Pyro and Nyx. So what's the difference? Let's take a look at Stanton. Lawful systems will be a mixture of high, medium, and low security areas. Each of these areas will be monitored by law enforcement agencies. And depending on the location, will dictate the emergency response time with high-sec areas being the fastest. Initially, this response will be measured, but over time will escalate to overwhelming force. This means if someone is attacked, if they can just hold out for a short duration, help will be on the way. Pirates will be able to disrupt this monitoring by shutting down the nearby comrades, but this will be highlighted in your star map, with dynamic missions being generated to bring it back online. But this is the PvP you already know and experience right now, just without security forces. But before we jump into an unlawful system, let's explore what options you have if you pirate a ship. OK, so first up, let's discuss ownership. All ships and high-value items that you own will automatically be assigned to you. This means if someone steals your ship, you can mark it as stolen, either via an insurance claim or in your Moby. This will then trigger a dead man switch on the stolen ship, meaning it will cease to function after a period of time. But what options does this leave as a pirate? Well, you can still salvage it. You can tow it back to your fabrication hanker to dismantle it for resources. Or if you have a high enough rep with the council, our criminal guild, you can get the dead man switch disabled and pay for a new title deed to become its new owner. Also, if you're in a lawful system, you'll need to find a transient jump tunnel, as all major locations and POIs 
will have custom security that will scan you on arrival. OK, so with that out the way, let's look at the unlawful system in Pyro. Unlawful systems have no laws at all. And with that comes opportunity. Pyro, as an example, has an abundance of high quality resources and is a hotbed of criminal activity. The literal definition of high risk, high reward. That's what I don't like. With crafting now, if it had high quality resources, resources you're going the, to want the to miners wouldn't have left to mine and extract yeah. them. This is where base raiding will become a new form of PvP, and it's founded on a combined arms ethos. Defending players will be able to add defenses such as walls, automated turrets, and most importantly, ground shields, a localized version of the planetary shields used in lawful systems that absorb the most powerful of weaponry. No longer can you just turn up and drop a Moab. <laughs> One huge difference, though, compared to planetary shields is that these shields can be disabled. You will have to strategically assess each base and punch your way through its defenses on foot to eventually bring down the shield generator. Once the shield is down, then you have options. You want to raise it to the ground, you can bomb it from the air. If you want to extract all the resources, though, you'll need to infiltrate the base using explosive charges and hacking while fighting off the defenders. Now, both piracy and base raiding is founded on sandbox gameplay. And again, that's the essence of Star Citizen. But we want to add more. Something where you can log on and immediately find the action and fight for a purpose. So first up, let's go on a history lesson. In the early 2600s, there was a fledgling corporation called SEAL that had developed a new system-wide planetary shield technology the same technology that will provide protection for your bases today. To prove this tech, they wanted to use Nix and Pyro systems as a testbed. With the promise of high quality resources, SEAL lured independent miners to man the shield network in exchange for shield protection for their settlements. As a prototype, SEAL couldn't provide total coverage over all the mining settlements, and so they created the SEAL Tokens program, allowing the most industrious factions to purchase SEAL coverage for their work. <laughs> the network consisted of multiple linked bases on the ground that then linked to several stations in orbit around each planet that then connected to the nearest relay in the SEAL network, which eventually linked back to the SEAL core, which oversaw system-wide distribution of the shield technology. Factions could then earn SEAL tokens for working on any part <coughs> of the network. They could then use these tokens to buy shield coverage. It feels like a block the game, competition block among, amongst factions being so intense, SEAL was only able to offer shielding to the hardest workers. Unfortunately, due to outlaw interference, SEAL eventually pulled out of Pyro and Nix and pushed for a more automated solution in more civilized systems. So fast forward to present day. Without SEAL's backing, they had to pull out and leave it as it is. And welcome to Station Warfare. With the SEAL network still in place, but lacking resources, orgs can take ownership of these structures to gain access to planetary shield tech. Let's go! Which, as you know, would make their bases invulnerable. Unfortunately, there's a catch. There isn't enough to go around. And as in the good old SEAL days, the system still works via the SEAL token program. To earn tokens, you'll have to assault a location and then deposit resources to power the network. This begins with ground bases and ends at the shield core. Each structure occupied will then accrue SEAL tokens over time, with larger structures earning more. And at the end of each week, you must then use these tokens to purchase shield protection. 
With shield coverage being limited, though, the system automatically selects the orgs with the highest bid from across all shards. Meaning for that week only, a certain number of orgs will gain access to shield protection. So this is a chance for your org to become the de facto leader of a system. It means you'll be able to log on and immediately find the action and fight for your org. And finally, it's not just sandbox PvP or ganking. You are fighting for a purpose. So once you've won your bid, what then? Well, to talk more about that, I'd like to welcome Ian Leyland, Star Citizen's creative director, to the stage. Good luck. Thank you. All right, hello, CitizenCon. Thank you, Rich. Thank you, Dave. So to continue the conversation of large-scale end-game org activities, let's go back to Pyro 3, where the ground bases were being built earlier today. This morning, we saw the small habitat being built by Luke. And then we saw Deck start to expand the base into a commercial enterprise. But eventually, we saw a massive example of an org base. But with everything Rich was talking about, with org system-wide activities, we want to give you guys the ultimate end goal. But also the thing we need to protect. And to do that, let's look up into the sky and see what it is. Space Station. Zeus, now! Also moves. No, it oh, is, is it a station or a ship? It looks like a station. No? It can be a ship. They already have ships. This is a station. But I could be a big ship. <laughs> yeah, that's the station. Could be a moving station. It's okay. It's not super cool. Unless you're supposed to build on it. Yeah, what if it's modular and you build it? Let me introduce you to player space stations. Nice. Finally, you can build your <laughs> home amongst the stars. This will be the starting point for your base of operations, for system-wide org activities. But why is this an end goal? What if I wanted well, to build the ground? First of all, to construct your own space station, you want to build a space station on the ground. Vast quantities <laughs> of resources <Yeah>. and materials, <laughs> and also will be a large time investment. But how do we start? Well, it all starts with the supply bay at the pledge store, <laughs> and the supply bay can only be constructed by the pioneer.
So you buy the Pioneer, then you buy the Supply Bay, then you buy... <laughs> Once it's created, <laughs> the, the Supply blueprint. Bay then handles the creation <laughs> of the station itself. Now, we're in grey box development phase, so the artwork's not final, but let's go on a journey and start building our space base. <laughs> It would be cool if you could keep building the base and then you have a Death Star. That would be cool. <laughs> a size 50 uh, railgun. <laughs> okay. It's crazy that they've already started building this. I, it's, I don't know, it's unbelievable, really. Yeah. Yeah. People say, oh, there's been no progress on the game in the past, you know, six years. <laughs> what the fuck are you talking Every about? Every streamer looks crazy right now. <laughs> the, the background is insane. Honestly, I'd, love, I'd rather be on the ground. Well, no, you have a don't, nice view from up there. Don't cross the streams, don't cross the streams. <laughs> <laughs> what, you'd rather be on the ground? I mean, why not both? No, 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 yeah, you're right, you're right. You're right. You can have everything. I like, I like a space elevator for my base, so I don't have to get on a ship. I can just wait for <laughs> 10 minutes and <laughs> Dude, look at the clouds, man. It looks better than real. <laughs> real, real. Hyper real. Awesome. Awesome. Turns. <laughs> so as you saw, the cargo grid of the supply bay consumes resources and the required resources will be substantial and will need to be topped up over time. So this means orgs will be encouraged to have efficient logistic networks to feed the supply bay. And as Rich outlined with and all the time people can attack you. ideal if your org is well-rounded so. in terms of roles. Even the starter player can contribute. The guy with the six javelins. <laughs> the supply bay has automated construction drones, it's just gonna which be going are used around. to create the station. And on non, unlike ground bases, many drones are used at once to create the base. Once the station is built, the supply bay then integrates into the station itself. So here we are. We've built Unless the they sell this in the pledge store, we're never going to get it. And <laughs> it's big. And out of the box, oh, this is a core the station comes readily built mm. with some core functionality. Nice. Let me talk you through it. Right on the top is the bridge, which is the command deck. This is where all further construction is going to be managed. From here, we can then monitor the, s the status of the entire station. We have access to power and water management. Power and cooling is something you'll need to consider carefully. It also is an area to set permissions for who can enter particular areas, either divided by the ranks of the org itself or open to the public. And there'll be a radar station to track the activity outside the base. And the terminals to access logs of who has visited the station and see what they did. So let's jump back in game and take a stroll through our bridge. Satisfactory devs who just quit. Just quit. <laughs> job. Yes. 
No, I mean their 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 factory is very modular, so you can make a lot of stuff. They should just buy them. They should just put them in this game. So there's gonna be only one type of station. Right? No, I just can't. There's only gonna be one type of station. <laughs> <laughs> what about the wallpaper? Can we buy like rust? You can buy wallpaper in rust. Now. Wallpaper? Wallpaper, yeah, like prints on the wall, uh, you know, huh. flowers, you know. Imagine the entire space station is <laughs> flowers. <laughs> it's garage. It's very cold and sterile design. We update it, right? I mean, I don't know how you would make a space station like this more homely. What do you do? Throw rugs and put a <laughs> fireplace? I don't know. Yeah. yeah, rugs on the walls, like the Russians. Super awesome. Do they really have on space? The back of the bridge do they leads have what? to a centralized transit really? network. Oh. This spine physically connects the entire station and will provide access to the various decks. Each level in the station will have a centralized lobby area, and this is your station. You'll be able to use the decorator mode, so you'll have plenty of space to theme it however you want. And speaking of having plenty of space, this space station will have a one-to-one -one interior So this is the org base that you're talking about. No magic elevators. Uh, I guess. Yeah. yeah. But if it was an R Corp, a building, then it will be protected at all times. You don't have to worry so about... So you can uh, circumnavigate around the entire perimeter, and it's wonderful. Okay, let's jump back in. As you can see, right at the bottom of the central transit system leads to the lower areas. This is where you'll gain access to the engineering deck. So like bigger ships, this is where all the hands-on engineering and maintenance gameplay happens. This will serve as the beating heart of your station. Then we have the hangar deck. And as the name implies, this is where you'll gain access to your hangar network. The base station comes with a large hangar already built, along with two docking collars, and also empty slots for another two medium hangars when needed. There will be a vast network of internal road systems, meaning you can quickly drive from one hangar to the other. No elevators needed. OK, let's check back in. Can someone check how much this ship is? Yeah, so the the normal one. Wait. Yeah, the max is like 200. Well, in euros, I see it at 280, and the TAC, oh. the the assault one or whatever, the military one, it's like 360 or so. So the the, the TAC doesn't have uh, building drones. I don't think so. I need to check.
they should not have been attacked because it's MISC. It doesn't look like an attack ship. It yeah. was just a quick uh, cash grab. <laughs> it's a scam. <laughs> it's a scam. The attack is a scam. All right. So your station hangar will offer some enhanced logistics. For example, there'll be spaces for several freight elevators. And there'll be empty modules for open ship parking for vehicles and ships, uh, vehicles and ground vehicles. And there'll be also exit points where you can simply drive out into your station. Then there'll be also an upper level for the observation deck. From the observation deck, you'll have a control room. And from here, you'll have master control over the freight elevators and the vehicle elevators. This means that even before someone has landed, their new cargo can be up into the hangar and ready to be loaded up. Now, everything we've spoken about so far is what comes with your station. Let's talk about what you can do to expand it. As I mentioned before, the station comes with a predetermined interior network of corridors and roads. And in this network, you'll find an array of bulkhead connectors. Bulkhead connectors will come in tiers one to three, which drives the size of room you're able to build. In the interior build mode, this is where you start to expand the interior of your station. The rooms will require resource and time to construct, and once built, you can rename each room, which will be reflected in the station's minimap. The interior of your station will have ample areas for you to expand. You can build generic empty rooms, and you can fill with items to your heart's content. You can also build specialist rooms where the theme and functionality is already set for you, such as mess halls or infirmaries or generator rooms. And of course, there are shops. So similar to the small shops we built around the ground base, this is on a much bigger scale. But that's just the interior. Let's talk about the exterior. <laughs> On the exterior, we have minor hard points. These are attachment points located on the upper and lower surfaces of the station. Using build mode, you can customize your station with a variety of modules which tailor it to specific functionality. Some modules cater towards resource collection such as gas, gas harvesters, while others are geared towards defense, like shields or turrets. This goes back to bridge operations of power management. A situation may arise where power priority is needed. Then we have major hard points. The core station module comes with two hard point connectors. Major hard points are used to connect substantial wing additions to your station. The first example. Wow. Awesome. Thank Dude, are they awesome. going to sell all this shit in the store? I don't know. The first example is the cargo wing. The cargo wing will dramatically increase your inventory the smaller capacity. Than the whole seas. So this is ideal for orgs <laughs> yeah. who are specializing in hauling. <laughs> then we have the refinery wing. <laughs> so you'll be able to refine resources on a vast scale. As it's in space, it's much more convenient than traveling to a ground base. Now, a player could buy resources from your cargo wing and then refine It's more complex than our type. In the refinery wing. <laughs> <laughs> and finally, we have the hangar wing. Gonna play with my arcade. So, all right. So, 
the bigger your fleet, the more hangers you'll want. There'll be a variety of hanger sizes as well as docking collars to help organize your fleet's deployment. All major hardpoint wings are connected via struts. And like the rest of the station, the struts are also internally traversable. OK, so let's recap on the exterior expansion wings. Minor hardpoints give us options on how to collect resources or provide automated defenses for your base. Major hardpoints gives us options on how you can specialize your base. Let's jump back in game. All this work in, the, in uh, base up. building started on the first quarter of this year. So they did all this, I don't know, in like eight months or something. Mm. So next year it'll be done. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, these spaceships are tiny. Do you think uh, when we grow up we'll get one of these? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that's the end game. Is uh, don't die, don't die before that, you get. Uh, <laughs> the end game of life. The end game yeah, of yeah. life. <laughs> <laughs> First, you have to make make it until that stuff is in the game, and then you have to have enough money to buy it on the pledge store. Happiest <laughs> day of your life, better than just on being born, get married. You, it's almost good enough so that you won't eat tits. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe <we> won't eat. <laughs> It'd be cool if there were different manufacturers and you had different kinds of space stations. Oh, um, yeah. But I think it won't be that difficult for them after they make the first one right. to uh, make different ones. Yes, Pedro has been working with us on this as well, so thank you. Looking cool. Customization is just as important as expansion. Similar to ground bases, You'll, You'll be able penis. to earn tints for your station. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. You'll be able to apply decals for your org logos. <laughs> Outside of minor and major hard points, your station will come with two unique base expansion points. One on the top side behind the bridge, and one on the underside. The top side will be for the crow's nest. Now, all the other modules built so far have very specific functionality. But I'll admit, this is for the org members out there who want the ultimate in personal space. So I guess that you could call that kind of the Avengers Tower. It's not exactly what I wanted, but... Uh... <laughs> I thought what you would do with this is you could be able to stack plates so you could have like multiple, uh, but apparently not. Maybe both from the bottom. Yes, it looks like the Avengers Tower, kind of.
So I'm going to be flying around the verse, and I want personal invitations to see what you've done in those rooms, okay? <laughs> Super cool. I can't wait to see what you do with it. Now let's talk about the underside. This is going to be for the flight, which also comes with an additional three major hard points. The flight deck is perfect for your rapid reaction forces. It's ideal for fighters, but big enough to fit most ships. It's the perfect home for your station's defensive air wing. And just like the hangars, there'll be an observation deck which can override freight elevators, ma making rearming quicker and easier during operations. So an org with a tight flight deck crew can be substantially more efficient than others. Now, this one's my favorite. Let's take a look. There's a few little Easter eggs in that video. But why do you need a flight deck for your rapid defenses force? Well, if you've built your super awesome station in a super lawless system, <laughs> now you're the potential targets for others. Everyone will have their eyes on your resources and wonder what gear you've got in your inventories. And let's say we didn't win the station warfare bid that Rich mentioned. Let's take a look at the inevitable. You're in there rearranging your posters. And <laughs> <laughs> the whole thing blows up. <laughs> What's the point? You know, you're trying to set your mug, your coffee mug on the table in the exact angle. <laughs> <laughs> I think the cinematic before this one referenced the Kickstarter video. I think it's what he was talking about with the Easter eggs. I just thought about it. Mm. I'll watch it again after this. <laughs> All the gold stuff. Okay. This is all so bullshit. Not only so far is in the your future, station bullshit. <laughs> for offensive campaigns. Just got it's to believe yeah. so one day it will be real. 
The exterior of the station itself can take quite a beating. It's going to be very hard to damage. So the goal of attackers instead will be to punch a hole through the defenses and get inside. The optimal way to do this punch will be to infiltrate through the flight deck or EVA hatches and work your way up. Once inside, <laughs> yes, once inside and you've cleared out a hangar, you may also want to consider airlifting in a tank or two to clear some corridors. Raiders will have to hack freight elevators or bulkheads in order to gain access. And of course, bring enough ships with them to start hauling out the loot. Gaining control of the bridge will allow access to storage, which would otherwise be unhackable. So, as a defender, there are a variety of automated defenses you're able to install internally within the station, such as blast doors, which seal shut, systems to be breached, and a range of turrets, like anti-vehicle or anti-personnel. These will all help slow down the attack and give time for your reinforcements to show up. So let's do a final recap. This is one of the right. end game goals for dedicated orcs and will be your base of operations for system-wide activities. The station what about a solo player? You should be able to do everything. The <laughs> and the exterior, <laughs> meaning you can tailor it to your own requirements. It's not fair. And I paid forty-five dollars for this game. Amongst the <laughs> Twelve years ago, I paid it. All content oh, belongs to me. I, I want to refund the whole work of Chris Roberts is mine I, I, now. I want all the gameplay. And that is the dry dock. Wait, no, ask, ask for a refund on my forty-five bucks. <laughs> Twelve years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Scam. This unique Scam. slot will be at the back of the station. It has its very own dedicated observation room with crafting stations and has a transit tram which runs along the inside of the arms, leading to the docking collars where your ship will be constructed. So, the only question still remains what sizes of ship can we build? Let's take a look. Idris. You can build Idris. Javelin? Retribution. Javelin, probably. Probably, <laughs> probably Javelin. I'll, uh, Bengal. I'll Bengal. <laughs> This is streamer content, streamer endgame content. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's a bingo. That is a bingo! Oh my fucking <laughs> god, okay. <laughs> you can't even buy that for money. No. <laughs> That's a scam! If you can't buy it for money, that is a scam. Very oh, ridiculous. Maybe you will be able to. T 10,000 bucks. <laughs> I have to say, it would be kind of cool if you couldn't buy it with money. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, look, if you can buy it with money, then you probably can buy the station too much. It's not an ugly thing, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool, the station's cool. Oh! Cool, very good. Dude! Okay. Very good. It looks like Holy PA now, it looks like... Shit. Yeah, yeah. So that means each dry dog can build a different Bengal. Okay, 
<laughs> okay. <laughs> this is all bullshit. It's never gonna happen. Is it? <laughs> so now we're talking. Multiple stations linking and dry docks to craft your I very own capital ship. The ultimate the end goal for any org. Okay. So let's take a step back. At the beginning of this presentation, I mentioned we had three types of players and one universe. And hopefully you can see we have purposeful the artist, gameplay catering to each the... type of player. <laughs> but that wasn't the only goal. The, the players so with the friends and the players without friends. We have the whales, the artists, the we have the whales, the artists. And this is where the... you come in. The community. $45 player. We have the free players <laughs> who are there for the whales to kill. Crafting blueprints. <laughs> A non-combat player mining for high-quality resources. You have the base, the wind to pay players with your friends, <laughs> <laughs> or a PVP player fighting for your orb in station warfare to protect your base. Each one of the players who will give us a lot of money, the players will give us a little money. You need the blueprints to craft. <laughs> you need the resources to make them, and you need the equipment and protection to be safe. This is what Star Citizen is. It's a universe that caters to all players. Now I could it's a giant probably scam. go on for another 10 hours deep diving into each system. It's a giant money printer. Yeah, I need to ask for my $30 back. I paid 12 years ago. But I do need to ask for about 30 you need to teach ISCs and SE lives and system comms. Not even 45. <laughs> to, to be fair, to it's probably worth uh, 100 right now. Game we are making. <laughs> probably, yeah. With inflation. To come with us on for this sure. journey. Yeah, but with, with his uh, uh, Larer items, you probably make a couple hundred bucks Thank or something. You, I don't know how much. Yeah. And can we welcome Chris Roberts? Probably make something. No? No? Yeah, one second. Jared. Okay. So Chris is not ready yet. So. We're gonna, There's about 20,000 people watching bit. now, like 30,000 on Twitch, oh, uh, five uh, on the ground, well, and there's also YouTube. Is so maybe 25, 30,000 people. Gonna get. I on my thing on the Welcome, Chris Roberts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had a schedule. Yeah. I was getting What's ready. Ready? I don't know. Hey, oh, you don't need this, right? Rich, Dave, and Ian, I hope you guys and girls loved what you saw there. I, it's um, having a definitive guys line Guys and the girls, what about the rest? It's incredibly empowering for the whole team. <laughs> so I think for all of you guys in the... Right wing, it's a right wing organization. Um, as I said, <laughs> present, introducing the presentation, All right. we will never all stop right. growing Star Citizen, even past 1.0. Extreme right. Part of what makes Star Citizen so special is the symbiotic relationship between... You guys, the community, and us, the developers. Like, I know I can be accused of your bank account and my bank account. I only need to look at Spectrum, Reddit, Discord <laughs> to see countless great ideas and suggestions that come from people playing a live alpha and seeing areas that can, the game can grow and improve. And often we take these on board because they will make the game better. And in oh, some ways, so you could say Star Citizen is a Chris Roberts game. I would say it's all our game. The developers, the community, it's a human game. The game. We're all building this dream game together, and it's a far right game. <laughs> far right trees. And, and I think that's what makes it's a it MAGA game. Cool. It's a I think MAGA that's game. Why you guys and girls have been here for as long as you have, and have supported us through thick and thin. Because she has to keep remembering that they have to get girls. Together, and I don't think it's <laughs> You can see that she almost forgets, you almost forgets the girl. To be involved at that level and have your voices heard and impact what we do. Because, you know, occasionally we'll do things and you guys are like, no, that sucks. And we're like, mm, yeah, you're right, we'll change it. Um, and also, like I said, we definitely read and look and hear um, all the stuff that you write. Some of it may not be so nice, but a lot of it is... Uh, really great, and uh, we take it aboard. They're reading We're just trying to build this amazing <laughs> universe for us all to live in together. Um, so, amazing. What defining 1.0 does, though, for us is give us a finish line in terms of feature and content. We are committed to delivering for when your life in the verse becomes truly persistent. Your gameplay 
to progress your reputation. The money you earn, the material possessions you collect and earn will persist even as we deliver more content and features. And I think that's incredibly important for really finding Imagine with all the bugs, also how much longer the grind will take. <laughs> <laughs> Try to win one blooper and try five times. It's also a market for the game to be more stable, well optimized, and incredibly friendly for new players, as well as experienced ones, which I think all you guys are. Um, but that will only be the start of our journey together, because there's the, vi the, vi the vision of Star Citizen as a game that has no sunset, one that will continually grow with new content and features. We'll always make sure we're on the cutting edge of new technology. We'll never be yeah, out there. It will make me immortal because, because we'll build a machine years, that will, will <laughs> upload my coaches. As you can see by our constant <laughs> presentations, we're always looking to make whatever we can do, whether it's the visuals, the he audio. He will never die. That, that's what he's doing. He's always going to be working on. He we'll will sacrifice all of us. He, he will get a brain chip in our, in our brains, VR, and then he will sacrifice all of us so he can be immortal. So, so I hope you've enjoyed this. Maybe that's what I will do. Make him in the uh, we'll battlegrounds demo, version. A small prologue to Open <laughs> Squadron 42 um, live with a few crashes to prove it. Um, as I said, there's a there's a really great full playthrough, no crashes that Rich did immediately afterwards. That's up on YouTube, and we've given a date to finally deliver the spiritual successor to Wing Commander that the team and I feel comfortable in hitting. We've defined what Star Citizen 1.0 will be and shown features such as base building and monster hunting that will be delivering the next 12 to 18 months. 4.0 and server meshing and pyro is coming at the end of this year. We're already in Evercati. We're going to deliver. Um, actually, some people have been streaming some stuff. And in coming weeks, we'll continue, continually stabilize and improve the experience as it moves into PTU and then goes to live. With this, we will have delivered the majority of what we showed last year at Star C uh, Citizen Con. Uh, with the remaining features uh, coming uh, early next year. And there are over 1,000 people committed, uh, 1,000 people at CAG committed to bringing you all this and more. We love what we do, and we're inspired by your passion and support. We know that we are truly lucky to have such a strong community that shares the passion and dreams we do. You allow us a privilege almost no other developer has, the ability to dream and reach for the stars. And I truly mean that because as, as a developer it's very unusual to be able to build a game of the ambition that Star Citizen is and Squadron 42 is and that's all down to you guys and girls so thank you very very <laughs> and, much and non-binaries and, non <laughs> and Wolfkin <laughs> Two Spirit whatever it is you know, Two Spirits and, and furries. And then over this past year, an incredibly passionate group of people have worked behind the scenes to bring this weekend's event to life. Uh, and I want to take a moment to thank Leah and Ed, Tyler, Jared, Kat, and so many others have poured their hearts into making this weekend special for all of you. Um, and a huge thanks goes out to our presenters and teams supporting them, whether they're here with us today or watching from one of our other studios around the world. In the worlds of Admiral Bishop, I'm proud to stand with our teams and everyone that put this show together. And all of the CAG staff working on the show floor, your hard work ensures everything runs smooth and keeps the energy alive throughout the event. And finally, a heartful thanks to the community members who volunteered their time to run this year's show. None of this would be possible without their dedication and support. I thank all of you very, very much. And, you know, many, many of us in the team are going to, myself included, are going to head down the road to the Factory International, the Enter the Atmosphere event um, that Amos is doing. Uh, so I hope you know, a fair number of you will manage to make it over there. Uh, there'll be a whole night. I wonder how much money they're giving Apple. They must be giving them money. Yogi uh, Klatt and Richard Tower, which I think uh, are, as always, they're, they're good panels. And uh, that, with that, Citizen 2954 is, comes to a close. I hope you enjoyed what you saw, made new friends, reunited with old ones, and marveled at the creativity on display at the community booth, which was pretty awesome to see. And you know, CitizenCon always underlines what makes Star Citizen special. So that's you. You guys here coming together, supporting, watching, giving us, the team, the energy to make this game. So thank you. And
We'll see you in the verse. Meanwhile, in the verse, 30k. <laughs> well, the, the, the game is pretty much broken right now, nothing works. So. All right, I'm out of here, guys. Got you later. Okay. Yep. See you later. 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 Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye. Later. Later, later guys. Later. Oh, is the stream still on? Uh, mm, it just ended. No, I mean, uh, the zombie. Yeah, because yeah. there's still music playing, so I wanted to let it end. Ah, gotcha, gotcha. Right. Cool. What am I doing? Alright, well, I'm gonna drop. Uh, talk to you later. Yep. See later. You. later.